Good morning, everyone. My name is Tapio Pesola, and I'm the Investor Relations Manager here at F-Secure. I would like to warmly welcome you to our Capital Markets Day. It's now been about two years since we last organized this event, and a lot has happened since. Today, we hope to give you a good update on what has been accomplished so far, and especially what our plans are going forward. Let's quickly run through the program today and introduce the speakers. So we'll start with Mikko Hyppänen, our Chief Research Officer, who will uh, tell you about the threat landscape. He'll be followed by our CEO, Samu Konttinen, who will explain the company strategy and focus. And then we'll take a deep dive into corporate security with Jens Tonke and Jyrki Rosenberg, after which we'll have a short break. After the break, we'll continue with Christian Janefeld and consumer security. And then finally, Erika Söderström, our CFO, will explain how, how our business and investments are reflected in our financials. And then we'll conclude with a Q&A. So, with that, I think let's get started. And Mikko, you can start your show. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for joining us today here at F-Secure headquarters and for those of you joining us over the live stream. My name is Mikko Hyppen and I am the Chief Research Officer for F-Secure and I am the oldest employee in the company with my 26th year currently being employed by, uh, by a pretty good company. This was a startup when I joined and clearly we're no longer a startup but I haven't had a boring day at work, I can tell you that. And being the chief research officer, it sort of comes with the territory that I'm a geek and a nerd. So I want to talk to you about pinball today. I collect old games, old video games. Mostly like coin-up video games, like old Ataris, but also pinballs. And the latest game I bought is um, Stern Ghostbusters pinball. And whenever I play my Ghostbusters pinball, it keeps shouting at me, who are you going to call? Those of you who've seen the 1986 movie will remember this. Who are you going to call? So in our business, when we run into security issues, <laughs> we have a uh, Windows feature update on this streaming <laughs> system. <laughs> Let's not do the update now. <laughs> Thank you. So when you see crime, who do you call? Well, that's an easy question. You call the cops. When you see cybercrime, who do you call? Well, it should be the same answer, really, isn't it? You call the cops. Except in our space, cops actually don't do much. Like companies, consumers, they actually resort to private companies, companies like ours, when they need help in this space. But what about us? Like when we see crime, as we do our investigations and our research, who do we call? Around two years ago, here at our Helsinki lab, we were investigating a, um, an exploit kit. An exploit kit organized and run by a Russian cyber gang, which we had been tracking for quite a while. And as we were looking at the exploit kit, it was clear that he was using a Java exploit in users' browsers as they were visiting particular websites. And as they were visiting those websites, it took over their computers and dropped a payload on the computers. Payload is the actual thing they want to do on your computer, which could be a backdoor or a keylogger or what have you. And as we were looking at this, we saw them change the payload. And they changed it to a banking trojan a new version of a banking trojan we had seen before. And we looked very quickly like what has changed and we saw that they had changed the bank that this banking trojan was targeting. And it was targeting one particular bank in a European country. So who are you going to call? Well, I picked up my phone and I called up my contacts at the law, law enforcement in that European country. They have to let them know there's a bank robbery going on. And the phone rings and rings. 
And then eventually it's picked up, but the guy who answers is, is not my friend, not the cop I knew there in the particular country. It was one of his colleagues. And I explained to him what's happening, and he's like, yeah, mm -hmm, uh -huh, all right, cool. Um, your friend is in training. Um, he'll be back on Monday. Can you call back on Monday? Now imagine for a second that I wouldn't have called the cops to report an online bank robbery, but a real world bank robbery. That hello, I just saw guys running into a bank with balaclavas on top of their heads. We would have a police car outside of the bank in five minutes. We would have a SWAT team in 10 minutes. But then when I called to report an online bank robbery, I'm asked to call back on Monday. So why the difference? Where's the lack of sense of urgency when we speak about online crime? Especially given that the amount of money you can steal with an online bank robbery is probably 10, 100 times higher than what you can steal from any real world bank today. So we spend our time at F-Secure Labs analyzing what the enemy is doing, where the attacks are coming from, how are they evolving, what are criminals doing, what are hacktivist gangs doing, what are the governments doing. And this year, 2017, has been unusual. Those of you who've been around for quite, a, quite many years will remember when we used to see malware outbreaks every now and then. Outbreaks like Melissa, I Love You, Blaster, Slammer, Sasser, around 10, 15 years ago. Around 10, 15 years ago, it was the norm that we would regularly see massively quickly spreading malware outbreaks. And then they went away. We sort of haven't seen them for 10 years now. And the reason why they went away is that criminals became the biggest attackers. Money-making criminals be became the biggest attackers. And if your target is to make money with malware, It's a bad idea to create malware which spreads so quickly that it becomes front page news. Like if you're trying to make money with malware and your malware is on the front page of CNN, that's bad idea. You don't want to be that public with your criminal operations. That's why most of the malware we see today is spreading slowly, infecting a thousand computers today, a thousand tomorrow, keeping below the horizon so they don't attract too much attention. And then, 2017, we get hit with, I think our focus is now off Tapio, off the slide, because of Windows update. You have to click the slide so I can click here. Thank you. So then came 2017 and WannaCry. And this was an exponentially quick Malware. It was spreading just like the outbreaks we used to see 10, 15 years ago. This is the first six hours of WannaCry spreading around the world. And the reason why it was spreading so quickly was that it was scanning IP addresses on the internet. Like you had one infected machine trying to find other machines to infect. It was scanning IP addresses and when it found a Windows computer which hasn't been patched for seven weeks, It was vulnerable to the exploit WannaCry was searching for, and then it would infect that system. And now that new system would also start scanning the internet for machines to infect. So we have two machines scanning, and they will both find a new victim. Now we have four machines, and they are all scanning for new victims. They will find a new one. We have eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. It doubles every round, and you end up with exponential growth. And WannaCry wasn't a success in financial terms, just like we were discussing. I mean, the reason why money-making malware isn't normally doing this is that this isn't very good business. And WannaCry wasn't a very good business. It didn't make much money in the ransoms it was requesting from people and from companies which were hit. And all kinds of organizations were hit. Private end users were hit, small companies, medium-sized companies, huge enterprises were hit. And since it is a ransomware Trojan, every victim knows that they've been hit. There's many other types of malware. If you get hit by a keylogger, it sits <laughs> silently in the background on your computer collecting your passwords and credit card numbers, and you will not know that it's in your network. 
unless an antivirus tells you or you get your next credit card bill and you see that someone has stolen your credit card. But WannaCry is visible. You will get the notification. So when we started seeing problems, they were very visible. In UK, ambulance cars were queuing to get inside to hospitals and they couldn't get inside because computers were down. Then we saw reports from all over the world from different places where customers were reporting that this clothing store in Madrid has their door infected by WannaCry. This is a parking meter in China infected by WannaCry. This is an information uh, screen in mall in Malaysia infected by WannaCry. And this here is the timetable at the Frankfurt train station. Now, the timetable system being infected by a ransomware Trojan is pretty bad, but of course it could be worse. I mean, this is, this is just a timetable. It would be much worse if a ransomware Trojan would infect the train control center. So here's the train control center infected by WannaCry. And we saw these problems all over the world. And this was a good example on how computers run everything today. Well, obviously train control centers are run by computers, but locally here in Finland, one place which was publicly reported that they had problems with WannaCry was the Kevitsa mine close to Sodankyla. And the problems they had were not really with their computers, the problems they had were with their drills, because their drills run Windows. So imagine a mine, mining operation getting stopped because their mines are locked by a ransomware trojan are now requiring a Bitcoin payment if you want to continue drilling. And this is the kind of problems we're seeing. So all kinds and all sizes of companies were having problems with WannaCry. And this was in May. Well, as soon as we got the first samples of WannaCry, we went looking for clues on where it came from. And eventually, we and other researchers were able to pinpoint a link from the WannaCry code to an attack which we actually saw two years earlier. A completely unrelated attack from two years earlier. And that attack was the SWIFT case. Attack in which the SWIFT banking network itself was not hacked, but five different national banks using the SWIFT network were hacked and the attacker tried wiring away almost a billion dollars from these banks. Some of the wires were stopped, but the thieves were able to steal roughly 100 million dollars. And we can link the swift attack to another attack, which happened three years ago, which was targeting a huge enterprise, a company in the United States in California, in Hollywood. We can link the SWIFT attack to the Sony Pictures hack from three years ago. And Sony Pictures was hacked because they were just about to release a movie called The Interview, in which, spoiler alert, the dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, gets killed. And North Korea was protesting very angrily against Sony for even attempting to release a movie like this, and then when Sony got hacked two weeks before the premiere, U.S. intelligence immediately announced that Sony was hacked by the government of North Korea. And when they made that announcement, I was as surprised as anyone else. Because we know that the reason why governments do cyber attacks is that cyber attacks are effective, affordable, and deniable. Effective, affordable, <coughs> deniable. And the deniability part is the most valuable part of this. Regardless of who did it, they can keep denying it. And it's always very hard to prove who did a particular attack. Because the attackers can always reroute their attacks through other countries and post false flag information in there. It's hard to prove who did what. And here, US intelligence immediately called it that this is North Korea. And then, two weeks later, we learned how they could do it. Two weeks later, New York Times broke the story on how U.S. intelligence had hacked the North Koreans two years earlier, and they were watching them do it. 
That's how you know. If you're watching them do it, then you know who did it. So, if we believe that Sony was hacked by North Korea, then it's highly likely that swift attack was done by the government of North Korea. Now, I actually had no idea what's the annual budget for North Korea, so I went to Wikipedia. Wikipedia says it's four and a half billion dollars. With the SWIFT attack, they tried stealing a billion dollars. That's a quarter of their budget. And that's a pretty clever way, pretty creative way, of trying to fix your budget deficit, if you ask me. And if we believe that SWIFT was done by North Korea, then it's highly likely that WannaCry was done by North Korea. And I know that sounds crazy. The idea that there would be a government which is so rogue that they would be willing to write ransomware Trojans to infect hospitals to demand ransom payments sounds crazy. But we have to remember that North Korean government is not a normal government. It's the only country in the world that I know which has been printing fake money for the last decade, the so-called super dollars. And if you're willing to print fake money, then maybe it's not that hard to believe that they're willing to do or try doing attacks like WannaCry. They failed making much money with WannaCry. But I think it's, I think it's quite likely that it, this was indeed North Korea. Seven weeks later, we saw the second, the other big case of 2017, which was Petya, another ransomware Trojan. Another case spreading exponentially quickly around the world. And the picture I chose for Petya is my favorite picture of Petya because it's an ATM infected by a ransomware Trojan. And this is nice because normally when you go to an ATM, you are asking money from the ATM. Now it's the ATM asking money from you. Please pay $300. And the attack against um, victims of Petya was a bit different, because this was what we call a supply chain attack. Supply chain attacks are when you don't hit your target directly, you hit them in indirectly by hitting something they use. You hit some service they use, and then you just wait them to use the service to get infected. In this case, the vector was a financial software company, a company called MEDOC, a company which was manufacturing financial software, including bookkeeping software and software for filing your taxes. They were hacked by the Petya hackers around two months before this. And then in the end of June, the hackers used the official MEDOC software update server to issue an extra update for the MEDOC financial software, and that update was Petya. So, if you were running this particular financial software, if you had workstations in your internal network which were running this software, you got infected. It was an automatic software update, checking the update server regularly, and if there's an update, it takes the update and deploys it. And now that the update server was hacked, every customer was infected. They, there was basically nothing they could do about it. The only thing they could do is to monitor their internal network. Like here, the traditional protection fails. I mean, even if you have firewalls, even if you have traditional antivirus watching your perimeter, this will go through your perimeter. It's a brand new, completely unknown malware. They've already checked that it's not detected by any current updates, by any antivirus. So it will get into your internal network, which means now the next step is critical. If you are running sensors in your internal network to monitor what's happening in our network, Petya is as obvious as night and day. I mean, it's really noisy in your internal network if you're watching for the noise. But many companies aren't doing this. Many companies only have a perimeter. They try to keep everyone out all the time. But if someone somehow gets in, like Petya, then there's nothing <coughs> they can do about it. There's nothing they would detect. And Petya, once it gets access to your internal network, it spreads like wildfire. It steals the Windows authentication tokens from the memory of the infected computer, basically becoming you. And then it uses your rights to connect to other workstations in the network. And if you have rights to run programs on other computers, that's what it's going to do. So 
in most cases, Petya wasn't spreading in internal networks using a vulnerability. It was spreading using a feature, a feature of Windows. And this was especially bad when it was an administrator who got infected, because they could run programs on everybody's computer. So the company, ME Doc, that was used as a vector in this supply chain attack. They are based in Kyiv, in Ukraine, which means almost all of their customers are in one country, in Ukraine. MEDOC is de facto software used by Ukrainian companies to, for example, file their taxes. That's why most of the problems initially were in Ukraine. Here's a supermarket checkout line in Kyiv, and every single cashier desk is locked by. Petya. And when Petya locks a computer, it actually overwrites the MBR, the master boot record of the computer. Which means when you boot up a computer, it doesn't start at all. It calculates how much memory you have and then it displays this. It, Windows never even starts. This is running run before Windows. Now imagine this happening to every workstation in your network. It's pretty bad. But that's not the real problem. Imagine it happening to your servers. Every server in every one of your data centers goes down and doesn't boot up. When you start up the server, the $100,000 server, it displays a ransom note. And then it happens to your ADs, your authentication servers, which means nobody in your network can log into your network because the AD is down. This is the reason why many large companies were sending consultants on planes to go around the world to data centers with Windows boot CD-ROMs in their backpacks to go and rebuild servers. The problem really wasn't the workstations, it was the servers. And this, why, this is why Petya was so bad and so expensive. And since it was such a target attack against one country, this has created all these theories that it actually wasn't a ransomware attack at all. This was a military strike from Russia against Ukraine. Now, we don't have the smoking gun on that. That's only a theory. I can't, I can't confirm in any way that this would have been an attack from Russia. But we do know that Russia has been very active in cyber attacks against Ukraine earlier in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Most famously, the Prikarbato Oblenergo attack, in which 250,000 Ukrainians lost power because power grid systems were hacked. So let's get, get back to my pinball. Who are you going to call? Who are you going to call when you see cybercrime and it's not done by criminals, but it's done by a government? Like, who are we supposed to call then? North Korea is launching a global attack, locking corporate PCs in all kinds of companies. Who are you going to call? That's a great question, and I don't have an answer for you. But it's clear that governments are now one source of these attacks. And I saw the effects of Petya myself. Because around a week before Petya hit, I had ordered myself a new iPad from Apple. I was expecting to get it in seven days. My iPad was delayed by three and a half weeks. And the reason why it was delayed is the same reason why this fast food joint is unable to serve chicken nuggets because of a recent cyber attack, the Petya attack. The reason is that the chicken nuggets, just like my iPad, was sitting in a container, in some container, in some logistics company's harbor, unable to move because their computers were hit by Petya and their servers were hit by Petya. Now, why would logistics companies be especially badly hit by Petya? These are not Ukrainian companies. Why would they be hit? Because they do business in Ukraine. Guaranteed, every logistics company does business in Ukraine because they do business in every country. Which means, regardless of where these companies are from, it's highly likely they have at least one or two or three workstations which were running MEDOC, so they could file their taxes in Ukraine. Which means they had an infected machine in their internal network. And the megatrend, which made ransomware problems a problem at all, is cryptocurrencies and especially Bitcoin. Bitcoin, which keeps coming up in our line of work all the time. 
together with Monero and Zcash, which we also see quite regularly nowadays, because they are even more anonymous than Bitcoin. All ransomware trojans are based on Bitcoin ransoms. All targeted hacks where ransoms are demanded, they use Bitcoin for it. If you were listening to uh, news this morning, you heard about Uber getting hacked a year ago, losing tens of thousands of customer records and driver records. And they paid a ransom of $100,000 to uh, make the hackers not leak the data. We don't know how they paid it, but it's pretty certain they paid it with Bitcoin. Bitcoin, which is now around 8,000 euros per coin, which means it's up 1,000% over the last 12 months. Let me repeat, 1,000% over the last 12 months. How's your investment doing? This is pretty remarkable. Of course, it's not a bubble. It will never pop, as we know. Well, someone asked me, because I, I made a forecast in the beginning of 2015 about the price of Bitcoin by the end of 2016, the new, last new year. And I said that it's going to be $1,000, which was ridiculous at the time. And it broke $1,000 on the 2nd of January. So it was spot on. So someone asked me last week on Twitter, okay, hey, make, make a new forecast. It's now 8,000. What's it going to be by the end of the year? And I told him, oh, well, it's obvious. It's going to be $2,000. And everybody was so disappointed, oh my god, it's going to crash. And then, hold on, it was $1,000 during New Year, it's going to be $2,000 this New Year, that's still 100% growth. Now, don't take investment advice from me. That's, that's a tip. One thing that is interesting, though, with the targeted ransom attacks, like the Uber case, where we don't know if they were asking the ransom in Bitcoin or not, but it's likely they were, in cases like that, it's not a question about ransomware. It's actually a targeted hack. A company gets hacked, the customer database is stolen, then they get a ransom note, which typically is that we're going to leak this information unless you pay us. And the interesting thing in these cases, which we've seen several over the last two years, is that these attackers clearly don't really know how much money they should be asking. With Uber, they asked for $100,000. We've seen similar cases where they've been asking for $1,000. Some cases, they asked for millions. The, the ransom demands are all over the place. These guys don't know what the going price for information like this is. And that will change next May, on the 25th of May. 25th of May, 2018. Every attacker will know how much money they should be asking because then they have a price point which is GDPR. As you know, if a company loses personally identifiable information of European citizens and they hasn't taken proper cost to secure it, EU can find them 4% of their global revenue. That's a price point. So my forecast is that next May, attackers like the Uber attackers are not going to ask for $100,000. They're going to ask for, I don't know, 3% of the global revenue or they're going to leak it which means company has to pay 4% of their global revenue. GDPR will bring benefits to European consumers and citizens, clearly. But one side effect will be that it's going to create a price point for attackers. So what else is happening? Well, IoT is happening. IoT revolution, which really actually started from factories, from industrial control systems. And the fact is that everything is going online. The way I think about this is that over the last 20 years, every computer has gone online. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we already had computers, but they were not in networks. Today, every computer is in some network. And what's happening now is that everything else is going online. Everything that uses power will be going online. And this factory revolution started way before nobody was, or anybody was thinking about connecting home appliances to the internet. And even today, when we scan the internet, we regularly find things like these. Factory control panels exposed to public internet, to anybody who's just searching for them. These have no passwords, nothing. You can go and connect to these things. And now that the IoT revolution is happening, now we are starting to find people's homes 
online. People's homes with no security, no passwords, no nothing. Which means you, you could go, this is somebody's home in Germany, and you know, turn off the lights, turn on the lights, turn off the alarm, turn on the alarm, look at the security cameras, anything. So the security problems we are facing with this new brave world of IoT are very concrete. And the core reason for these security problems is that when you go, when you go shopping for a washing machine, you are not asking questions about what kind of firewall does this washing machine have or what kind of intrusion prevention technology do you have. No, no, no. You're asking how much is it? Price is the most important selling point for home appliances, which means home appliance manufacturers can't afford to invest money into cybersecurity because that would make their product more expensive than the competitors and the new features they would get would be the features that nobody's asking for. And that's the trend which is behind attacks like Mirai and Reaper. These, these are the two largest IoT botnets we've seen so far. Mirai infected around 120,000 heat pumps and IoT security cameras and VCR recorders. And the way it infected them was trivial. It was just scanning the internet for IoT devices, then it logged in with default passwords <coughs> because people don't change the password. Of course they don't, because they don't read the manual. And for many companies, this IoT revolution creates a new headache, which is that employees are bringing IoT home gear to the workplace and then connecting it to the corporate Wi-Fi. People bringing IoT water boilers to the kitchen and putting it to the Wi-Fi. And now that's the weakest link in the corporate network and the IT department doesn't even know it's there. They don't even know it's there. And we regularly find vulnerabilities from these appliances where they, for example, leak the Wi-Fi password to anybody who asks for it. And this is the reason why we started building F-Secure Sense three years ago when we started the projects to investigate IoT security. And F-Secure Sense works. For example, Mirai. It stops Mirai dead. No matter how vulnerable your devices are, no matter how bad passwords you have on them, they won't get infected if they are behind an F-Secure Sense network. And this is now not just a home issue, it's also a company issue. And today, every single company is a software company. Your company is a software company. It doesn't actually matter what you do. Today, the differentiator between the successful companies and non-successful companies is how good they are in digitalization. And just like we were discussing during Petya, it's no longer good enough to try to keep all the attackers out all the time. Especially if you have really large networks, it's impossible to keep them out all the time. You will always have some breach in some part of your network. If you have large enough network, you will always have a breach somewhere. So how many of the Fortune 500 are hacked right now? Answer, 500. Why? Because every single Fortune 500 company has a network of hundreds of thousands of workstations. Is every single one of them clean and unhacked? No. If you have hundreds of thousands of workstations, there's definitely some breach in some part of your network. And this is the reason why we've been building new solutions like RDS, F-Secure RDS, to protect companies by monitoring their network and using sensors to be able to tell that something is behind the perimeter, like having a motion detector in your network. And if this is true, then it means that this is now a board level topic, a permanent board level topic for any company. Right now, IT security becomes a board level topic when there's some big case happening, like WannaCry. Then it's maybe a board level topic for one or two meetings. That's not good enough. It has to be a permanent topic. And it also means that companies have to work with hackers with services like bug bounties. We've been running a bug bounty for years. We actually give a permission to hackers to hack our systems. You have a permission to hack our systems. 
The only thing we require is that if you're able to hack our systems, then you tell us. And then we will pay you money. That's a bug bounty. This is how it works. So we are crowdsourcing hackers to tell us about vulnerabilities in our systems. And we're not the only company doing this. Companies like Apple and Facebook and Google do the same thing. Very few Finnish companies do it. But we do it. Because we believe security is not a product. We believe security is a process. And we believe we are the company to help <coughs> other companies build that process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikko. Uh, while Samu is preparing for his presentation, I think we can take one question uh, from the audience. And Samu, you're, you can already Preferably come on stage. Preferably be about pinball. <laughs> pinball is a good topic. Or Anyone want the venture? <laughs> Hello, this is um, Hanna Rahola from AOP. Uh, how do you see this the responsibilities when you're talking about IoT equipments? Is the manufacturer or distributor or end user? And when you have, a, let's say, two different kind of products, let's say Google, uh, this uh, Nest, and then you have a television, and you will be hacked by, let's say, these products are, let's say, incompatibility. Mm -hmm. And then you get hacked. Who is responsible for security in these kind of cases? What is your opinion about that? Especially with home appliances, isn't it a little bit weird that if you have a washing machine and it has a safety issue, the vendor is, is, is um, responsible for it. But if, if it has a security issue, they're not. So if you buy a washing machine and it has a short circuit and it catches fire and it burns down your house, the vendor is responsible. But if the very same washing machine leaks your Wi-Fi password and as an end result, every single computer in your home is locked by a ransomware trojan, they're not responsible. So to me, it's clear. It's the vendor. The vendor building the devices should be responsible. End user is just a consumer. We shouldn't be putting the responsibility there. It really should be put with the vendors. Which very easily then leads to discussions about things like regulation, which is a whole different ballgame. I'm not a, really a fan of regulation at all. But the responsibility question to me is clear. It's the vendor. Okay. Thank you for that. We will continue with the questions at the end of the Capital Markets Day. Then, Samu. Your All presentation. Right. Am I on now? Good. Hey, good morning, everyone, also from my behalf and uh, also people joining online. So uh, thanks, Mikko. It's always fascinating to, to hear Mikko to talk about the, about the industry and everything happening in our domain. Uh, I'll be walking you guys through uh, how do we see the market from F Secure perspective and uh, what kind of a stance and focus we are taking with F Secure strategy. I think the sub-headline here already is quite explanatory, so gearing for accelerated growth. And I think that very well dances the tone that we also given this year uh, to investor community that we are really going for growth. We, we want to be a growth company. This is a growth industry. We want to go for, for market share gain, and we are not optimizing the company at the moment for, for certain profitability. We believe that the, there, there will be a better time than, than today to, to surface the profits that you can typically surface in our highly scalable software industry. Uh, we are definitely uh, in the middle of a transformation. And uh, if you look at F-Secure, uh, two, three years back, we were really focused in consumer security. The operator channel, a brilliant, brilliant channel that we, we built across uh, 15 years. And, and, and partnering today with more than 200 operators, that, that really carried F-Secure really well for, for, for many, many years. And, but today, what we are doing predominantly is focusing, investing in B2B business. And that transition we started about two years ago. Today, we are not just an endpoint security company. We carry much broader portfolio in cybersecurity. We added services to our offering catalog, so not only a product company, but really a comprehensive cybersecurity company offering both products and services. And keeping in mind that although predominantly we are seeking the growth from B2B side, we are not abandoning the consumer business. It's still a very important part of our financial poster. It's more than 50% of our revenue 
and it's very profitable. So we need that financial healthiness of consumer business going forward. So that's definitely part of the pack. But the main growth vehicle going forward is in B2B. And uh, as we are have here as a theme for 2018 and onward, so we really go for accelerated growth. I think we are today witnessing quite good momentum in, in, in B2B growth. So if I recap briefly, like the first nine months of this year, our B2B growth has been 16%. But at the same time, many of the newer products that we announced and started pushing about a year ago, well, year ago they are only in the very beginnings. So we, we firmly believe that if our investments are working, the market is definitely there, as you, you heard from, the, from Mikko. So demand is there. So our thinking is that we want to be accelerating the growth, B2B being the focus for, for growth. And some of the mega trends, this is a little bit maybe a recap or summary of the stuff that you heard from Mikko. I think these are very re relevant for, for FCQ. This is kind of a the headwind or actually the tailwind uh, for, for our business. Cyber attacks, they continue increasing both in volume and in complexity. It goes hand in hand with the digitalizations. As companies are becoming more digital, everything is online. For bad guys, it means that there's just increasing attack surface. And that yields more and more demand for cybersecurity services and myriad of cybersecurity products. Geopolitics, that's very, I would say, special for F-Secure. If we were to discuss this topic three, four, five years ago, the fact that F-Secure is a Finnish company, I wouldn't have highlighted that so much. But today we see increasingly the fact that especially certain industry verticals, for them, the fact that F-Secure is not an American company, and not a Russian company, not a Chinese company, it starts to matter more and more. And this shift really started about four, three, four years ago once Edward Snowden came forward how American technology companies practically have been forced to implement backdoors for their cybersecurity surveillance activities. Cloudification, I think that's important also in our industry. So in the good old times, you could say that the company IT systems, everything were closed behind the perimeter, behind the firewall. Everything was very well controlled, very well contained. And today, everything is going to the cloud. You might be accessing some of your company services, some of your resources that are in the cloud. You might be accessing those services with devices other than the well-contained, well-controlled company-provided PC. You might be accessing those cloud services with your uh, smartphone, with your tablet. And for many companies, they haven't implemented proper security measures, proper security processes. So how are those devices protected, although those devices are used daily to access the company information that is in the cloud? So this is, this is also a driving change in the security industry. And I think if you look at all this, what it practically means, and what we also heard from Mikko, how these cyber attackers, they are so clever, they are so persistent, that if they take your company as a target, they will get in. They will always get in. So this is driving accelerated demand for capabilities, not only to stop and prevent, but to detect. You have to have those capabilities to detect and to response, because you cannot count anymore that you can stop everything. A second very important part here is the need for outsourcing. The cybersecurity is becoming so complex that more and more companies are just understanding that there's no way on earth that with their own internal resources they would be keeping up with the industry demands. And this is driving fast growth also for cybersecurity services. And uh, all of this practically centers uh, to the fact that also the IT environments are becoming so complex. So there is increasing need for better security orchestration. And what I mean with better security orchestration are the facts that if some part of the network is compromised, so how, how will the other part of the network understand? So how will different products talk together? This calls for much more integration between the products versus standalone isolated solutions. 
And looking at this market, this is a huge market. So this year combined cybersecurity industry about 80 billion. And you see the split here very well that the consumer security is a, is a bit less than 5 billion industry, still growing. Then B2B products, much bigger industry, 7.4% annual growth, and the cybersecurity services, the biggest part of it, and growing fastest. Also important to know this that we today at F-Secure, we need to be quite conscious of our size, conscious of our scale. So we are not trying to cover everything that is embedded in this broader cybersecurity market. We need to be focused. And this practically now underscores the areas where F-Secure today is investing. So if I start there from the right or from your left, that would be the, the B2B endpoint protection industry. This is where we have our roots. This is the industry that we've been uh, participating for almost as long as the industry has existed. This industry is still growing, but it's not a fast growth industry. And our main growth initiatives from f perspective are not, not loaded there, although we, we see that industry growing really nicely for, for us as well. The next one is in this endpoint detection and response. This market is emerging only now. It's sometimes very difficult to define a very strict lines between these silos, if you will. And, and uh, why I point out this here specifically, so with this estimate, the number coming from Gartner, they think that this industry is kind of 0.4 billion. But then, then again, there are some, I would say, industry giants in our space. Perhaps the best example would be a, a company called Palo Alto, who is already about two billion in revenue. They are known from their next generation firewall offering. And in the last couple of years, they've expanded their next generation firewall, so they've also added endpoint detection and response. And whether those revenues from Gartner perspectives are, are booked under the next generation firewall or kind of an expanded next generation firewall or whether it's booked here beats me, I don't know. So point perhaps is, I think here the main, main message is that this is not a huge market today, but it's growing awfully fast. It's growing awfully fast. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that at the, at the next slides, and some of my co colleagues will, will offer even more deep dive on that domain. The next one in vulnerability management. Uh, today, if you look at all the cyber attacks that companies are facing, about 80% of these attacks are enabled because companies are running unpatched, outdated software. And this is the fact that is driving a fast growth also in this industry. The IT environments for companies are becoming more and more complex. It's becoming more and more difficult for the IT administrators to make sure that everything is kept up to date. Everything is patched at the moment when the patch is released. I think the statistics are something like that, that when a vulnerability is, is disclosed to an operating system or a software, it on average takes about 15 days before the patch is available. So there's typically a, a window of 15 days when practically the whole world is very exposed. But after the patch is available, it takes on average for companies about 100 days before they go and patch it, even if the patch was available. So there is that about 85 days slowness that just gives a tremendous attacking surface, an attacking opportunity for, for bad guys. And that's why I think this industry will continue seeing a very fast growth going forward. An industry where F-Secure is also active with our product, F-Secure Radar. Then we have last year cybersecurity services. This is by far the biggest market there growing fast I think one important way to understand and, and analyze that market that it, it is a supply-limited industry currently. 
we, we feel it ourselves. We, we would be growing faster in this industry if there was more resources available. There is a huge talent shortage in this industry. And then last, we have the consumer business, which continues being important for F-Secure. This is still today, I would say, predominantly about internet security, uh, a product cat, uh, range that most of us would understand as antivirus, although the product does today way more things than just blocking viruses. You have parental controls, you have browsing protection, you have banking protection, and my colleague will talk more about that. So it's a, it's a more com comprehensive offering than just antivirus. But high level, it is predominantly the only market where you have sufficient big industry volumes. There are emerging categories in privacy, where we have products like VPN, uh, uh, F-Secure Freedom, and then the home, connected home offering, uh, where we have offering called F-Secure Sense. But these are still today small markets, and I would say only time will tell that these will eventually be big enough industries that you could see the whole of consumer security industry being a fast growth industry. And um, here I think the key reflection from FCQA perspective is that uh, we are really now focusing on this, on this meat market and why I think meat market is very important for, for FCQA. It's often underserved, so most of our American com uh, competitors, they really focus on this huge enterprises, that's, that's the starting point for many of them. And now in the, in the mid market, the influence of the, of the channel is still quite significant. And that's very important as these mid-sized companies, they really lack the capabilities and competencies to manage everything themselves. So they rely on those sales channels, they, they rely on those managed security service providers or managed service providers. So, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of that industry is going more and more towards outsourcing the, the security. And as F-Secure, we have a lot of track record here building capabilities to the product that really allows the chan channel to build services, opportunities on top of the technology we provide. So that really is a, a stronghold for F-Secure. Today, if I look at our business mix, so about half of our revenue come from consumer and then the B2B revenue which ranges here, a good chunk I would say is here somewhere in between. We have some cybersecurity consulting really, really also on the enterprise and this is where the, the center of gravity points for f -Secure. This is the sweet spot that we are going, going after even, even more clearly going forward than, than than was the case in the past. And this gives you some idea about the security expenditure at different sizes of companies. And here I think the really essence with this meat market where we are focusing is that with meat market, the customers at the companies are spending in IT security way beyond small companies who just spend on endpoint protection. So bigger company here doesn't only mean for F-Secure a bigger endpoint protection opportunity. It means an opportunity to push a broader range of solutions, services. So not only the endpoint protection, but really a full portfolio coverage. And that, I think, is really the core of F-Secure economic engine going forward, that we get to have full leverage of our portfolio so that not being only an endpoint security company, but having capabilities and products in place also in detection, in vulnerability management, in cybersecurity services, and patch management. So the, the, the whole range of services that we today carry way beyond just endpoint protection. And that, that's why it's very important that we manage well in this transition and really being a best of class vendor for what comes to meat market. And here I think uh, if you look at the, the story of F-Secure and the journey that we've taken so far, I think this illustrates this really well. So a couple of years back, 
FCG was really known as an endpoint security vendor. Today, for B2B, we carry a portfolio that is much broader. So the endpoint would, would fall into this prevent category. Today, we have products in place for detect the FCG rapid detection service. We carry a good range of different cybersecurity services in the respond area. We do things, not only the incident response, we carry forensics, we do red teaming. So many of the cybersecurity services that really complement the product business. And I always try to remember to remind that although we made an entry to cybersecurity services and we see that as a fascinating good business opportunity, but it's primarily adjacent and complementary to product business. We are not turning the company into a consulting house. So it's really the, the best of suite offering that being capable to offer also services that complement the product business. But I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that also going forward. And then the last here is the predict, the f radar that was in this vulnerability management space. So this is where we are today. A good progress already. And now going forward, what, what we have ahead of us, we need to be able to integrate these products better together. Today, I think they are a bit more of a one-off point solutions. And going forward, we will be putting efforts of integrating everything to a more seamless turnkey solutions. And not only integrating the products, but being able to package and combine products and services. And this is very, very important because through that path, you deliver synergies for the customers. And it's very important that for the customers in this industry, new customer acquisition is difficult, it's expensive, but the customers that you manage to acquire, it's very important that you provide them easy, efficient way to upgrade their solutions from whatever you sold them in the beginning, so you sell more of your additional solutions on top of your initial sale. And I think this kind of illustrates that view, that there is this initial sale that you typically happens in the beginning, and then you want to be able to sell additional solutions as you go forward, and also adding cybersecurity services. And if you go back in time, two years ago when F-Secure was practically just endpoint security company and really servicing consumers and small companies, the business opportunity was practically just this. First, we didn't have portfolio beyond endpoint security. Problem number one. Problem number two, even if we had the small companies and the consumers once you sell them the endpoint security, it's not like that they're going to be needing a lot of other stuff. And that's why the transition for servicing not only consumers and small companies to bigger companies is very important because we get the uh, full leverage of the full portfolio. And in this industry, I think that you can grow in a scalable fashion. It's very important, very important that your growth is not only dependent on new customer acquisition, but a good chunk of your growth also comes from cross-sell and upsell to your existing customers. And this is a journey for f -Secure. We are only in the beginning of this. We are seeing really good first signs. We are very happy how RDS and radar has taken up, but I really want to emphasize that we are only in the beginning of this journey. And here, I think uh, we want to share a bit more about this industry paradigm shift. So in the good old times, the attackers, the, the cyber criminals were not so capable, not so persistent. A very good endpoint protection product was sufficient. Today, we know that that doesn't do it. You need more. You need capabilities to detect. And that's why we also started to invest in this industry. This gives you an idea about the paradigm shift and about the momentum behind this. So we entered this. 
detection as a service. This is what F-Secure Rapid Detection Service does. Today, or last year, the thinking is that only about 1% companies use that. And the thinking is that in about four years, this business will go 15-fold. It's a huge growth. And we are definitely tapping into that one. This is where we are today. Another version of the same, but not exactly the same, is a more pure play technology, where there is no service component embedded. A lot of technology is here. The artificial intelligence, machine learning is utilized very broad, uh, broadly across both. But this is really an automated detection capability. This is pure play product business. This is where you have services embedded. This is what we do with RDS today. And this will be our biggest launch 2018. So this is perhaps the main news item that we are delivering today at the Capital Markets Day. And Jürgen Rosenberg will tell a bit more about this. So we will be adding to our portfolio a fully automated endpoint detection and response product during next year. So start at the FC or rapid detection service, and I'm now underscoring the service. And this is going to be a pure play technology, fully scalable, a lot of technology synergies with this piece, and a lot of sales and go-to-market synergies with world-class endpoint protection where we have a strong foothold already. So this is a fast growth market as well. So if we go back to the previous slide, so this is what industry analysts are thinking about this. So about 10% of companies today have upgraded their endpoint protection so that it also has the detection and response capabilities as a pure product business. And by 2020, this will go more than threefold. And we want to be tapping into this opportunity as well. And then looking at these two both things, both the pure play product business and co combine it with the services, this really is the centerpiece of F-Secure growth strategy going forward. And a uh, few words about the cybersecurity services that we added to our services catalog a couple of years back. We've done total, I think now, three acquisitions in that front. So we talk about combination of man and machine. And practically what it means that when we have many of the world's best cybersecurity experts, people like Mikko, we get to do services assignments with companies when they've been breached. It means that we are doing incident response, we are doing forensics. We are witnessing attacks, studying attacks that nobody has never ever seen before. The attacks are often polymorphic, they mutate. It's not that you come across these as virus samples in a good old way. That's not how the cyber criminals work. These attacks are orchestrated, they go into the stealth mode, they are targeted. You don't come across these technologies in the wild. You need to be working with those companies who get exposed to those attacks. And as we have this world-class consulting capability to study and understand these attacks, helping companies to recover, we are getting tremendous threat insight that we are then feeding into our products. And this, we believe, as a combination, is, is providing a very clear competitive advantage for F-Secure, being able to deliver and uh, develop products that are better than anybody else. And looking at our go-to-market model, so very much a, a partner-led business model. So B2B products are sold through uh, more than 6,000 resellers. The consumer business through more, more than 200 operator partners. There's also retail and e-tail business. Uh, Christian will talk more about that. And, and these cybersecurity services, often we deliver these, or mostly we deliver these directly to end customer. But as I, as I said in, uh, earlier, so our plan is to start building models where we 
more integrate also services and products to a turnkey solutions for customer, allowing easy upsell, easy cross-sell, uh, bigger accounts, bigger, better customer uh, stickiness. As the more products and services a customer buys from us, it's very unlikely that they go and swap a vendor, obviously provided that you are doing a good job. And here, a summar summarized view how we see all these uh, different segments being adjacent to each other. So large enterprise, not the focus, but as we serve some of these as well, we are getting learnings that we get to leverage in the mid-market and all the way scaling down to smaller businesses. And we have a lot of shared security technology also with our consumer business, especially if you look at the traditional endpoint protection. So this is where the synergies are really big, so we are using the, the exactly the same technology uh, base, uh, protecting both consumers and companies because the need is the same. You need to be able to stop the attacks. Whereas for businesses, that isn't enough. They, they need more and they have bigger wallets to, to buy, buy more. And now closing with the summary about F-Secure growth drivers. So wider and better integrated portfolio, incre increased share of wallet, cross-sell, upsell, very, very important. Adding new customers in focus geographies. I like the word focus here. We are, we are not trying to conquer the world. We are not trying to build or scale up our sales operations so that tomorrow we would have a strong presence in about 150 countries worldwide. We continue to be very European focused. We have business outside Europe in, in, in Asia Pacific and uh, Latin America and North America, but Europe in the next couple of years definitely going to be the core of FCQ. That's our home base. We want to win there first before we go and test our wings in, in North America against the, against the competition there. Best-in-class renewal rates, that's very important in the business healthiness and that also builds on the cross-sell and upsell opportunities. So the customers that you acquire, you, you need to keep them. You absolutely need to keep them. And last but not least, we've been quite vocal about that during the last year or so, that we are actively looking at, uh, at m and And now, if you understand the, the company's strategy, the focus, so the m and really would be geared towards product and services that is a great fit for meat market and products that integrate together with the existing offering. So not building these uh, isolated point solutions, but rather build a product family, rather build a modular approach where cu customers enjoy easy and seamless cross-sell and upgrading the functionality that they get from F-Secure. And as, as in the services space, we see it being so well adjacent to product business. So we continue also looking M&A in cybersecurity services, looking at those best of breed, best in class cybersecurity boutique companies predominantly in Europe. So this is my, I believe was my last piece. Yeah. Uh, okay, so while Jens is making his way uh, on stage, again, we can take one question. Uh, from the audience and here, Raul. Hi, uh, Raul Etelmeck from Danske Bank. Uh, just a question on the integrated product suite. I understand that's uh, already something that the sort of enterprise provider, providers in the States are already doing. So how is the sort of mid-market competition doing in that sense? Uh, are they already providing this integrated solution or are you the only one? I, I don't think that we would be the only one. I think a couple of uh, things to keep in mind there. First, uh, really the big American cybersecurity, I call them supermarkets, they, they definitely have that. So they have such a, a big range of solutions that uh, it's, it's very difficult to build a differentiation, something that they wouldn't do at all. So you, you need to focus and you need to do something that, that, that you do it well enough. Uh, Companies that are 
pushing about the same strategy, same kind of offering. I would say the best example would be Sophos from, uh, from UK. They also have the mid-market and best of suite thinking. Most of the vendors, however, as they focus on this enterprise, they go with these point solutions. Because the enterprise, they carry so big IT capabilities in-house, they can take those point solutions. They ha have huge IT staff. And one day, once they try to transfer that to mid-market, and then you start explaining this point solution, this point solution, this point solution, this point solution to this mid-market IT guy. He is like, I can't handle this. Give me something that I can manage. Give me something simple. Or could you manage all these for me? So the, the mid-market really goes for this packaging solutions cleverly versus best of breed. Okay. Thank you, Samu. And then, yes, we enter the realm of corporate security. Yeah. Thank you, Samu. Oh, I'm not stealing your. Okay. So, my name is uh, Jens Tonke. I'm the head of uh, cybersecurity services. And today I want to tell you what role we have in F-Secure and why this is important to the business. It has been partly be covered by, by Samu, but I will dig more into it. We in cybersecurity services are at the absolutely forefront of cybersecurity. So what is it actually that we do? We break things. We break into buildings. We intercept what's happening at the offices. We even fly drones up to the offices and spy and see what's going on in there. And we fool people in order to get access to their computer, to their laptop, or to business critical systems. We fool them in so many ways, you cannot believe it. So why are we doing this? Because we like it very much. I will say that if we were not paid for it, most likely we'll do it anyway. Luckily, we are paid for it by the customer, and it's completely legal what we are doing. But we do it to better understand how we can help our customer protect them against this world of thieves that every day are stealing information from you, companies, organizations. And we use this knowledge not only to protect them and help them to protect themselves, but we also use this knowledge to build new solutions like RDS, or what I like to call it, our cyber security alarm system. But more about that later on. I believe that the guys we have working for us in cybersecurity services and in F Secure as such belongs to the absolutely elite of the cybersecurity society. And we, we help people on all levels in the organizations. As Samuel said, we predominantly work with enterprises and, and the SMEs. And we do that on the strategic level. So we go in and we help the board members, the C-level guys, to find out what kind of risk is there to be looked for. And what is the likelihood that this risk will, you know, somehow come true and they will be breached to the more tactical level, defining a policy that actually defines processes. Because it's, it's very much about processes. Processes and, and controls in order to make sure that the policy that we now have defined uh, and defines the, the level of security that we need in the company actually is compliant down the road to execution where we do assessment, all kind of assessment. It can be PCI, which is at least the guys that is working in the bank should know. But it can also be GDPR.
our services is divided into these three areas. If you start from the, the very bottom, we have cyber intelligence. So what is cyber intelligence? Cyber intelligence is like open source intelligence, which means that we actually look for whatever uh, information there is on social networks, forums, uh, like uh, what's everything that is public available on the net. We look into that. We do it by using whatever tools that is available and some in-house developed tools. As you can see, we have actually built a platform that makes this search a lot easier. We do it to help our customer try to predict where will the threat come from. Who is it that will most likely try to, to do something bad to us? And we also use it in forensic cases where the company already has been breached. And we will try to find out who was it that stole these very business critical information from us. Who did that? Security risk uh, and management is, is more about people, its processes, its partnership. And what we do here is that we help the organizations. We help the, the C-level board to prioritize what is it that makes most value for them, where should they use their time, and we, we even built security improvement programs where we over a two, three year period of time prioritize and help them to deploy the needed security measures. And as Miku uh, was mentioning, GDPR is maybe at the moment the single biggest challenge for many companies because the fines are enormous. And maybe we should start you know, setting our price on our services based on what Miko just said. It could be 2%. It will be 1% cheaper than what the bad guys were doing. Um, anyway, the fines are so big, and many companies have tremendously, are tremendously busy in, in making sure that they will not uh, be in breach, because if they do, it will be extremely expensive. Then technical security services, it's more or less defines all the different type of assessments and I will not tell you about all these today, but I will only say that it covers everything from doing normal web security assessments to hardware hacking, uh, which is some skills that we uh, got due to the, one of the latest acquirements we had. Uh, and we're using these skills to help manufacturers in, for example, the automotive industry, how to build in security to the cars, because their security actually matters. And they are taking this extremely serious. We're also doing red teaming. Do you all know what red teaming is? You do. Good. <laughs> Red team is breaking into companies, organizations using all means. Using all the means that I was talking about in the beginning. We fool ourselves in. We break in. We do all the nasty things. And what we have found out is that we are quite successful in doing this. We are actually so successful that every time we do a red teaming project, we will succeed. And when we go back to the customer and tell them, by the way, we actually achieved three out of your five targets that defined for, for, your, for, for us. We, we, we actually succeeded in breaking into your CEO's office and place a microphone under his desk. We succeeded in, in breaking into your data center. We succeeded in breaking into the buildings because we had one of our consulting standing outside the building, smoking a cigarette with some of the other guys, you know, in a random door. And when they were done smoking, he went with them in. 
And he went into the building and then he placed a small device like this to a network block. And suddenly we could gain access to the, net, to the internal network. And we could start hacking around. And the companies, of course, they, they sit a little bit like you. Wow, that, that, that's pretty cool what you did. Uh, amazing. And then they sit with the, uh, the thought, this is really bad. So, so what, what should we do? And I, I tell them, you know what? We have given you a, a full report. The report will tell you exactly what you should do, which processes you should, you know, make better, what kind of uh, doors, like the, the gates we have now installed outside here, should have doors like that. But you should also have a process that's kind of described that you should have uh, wear a, a, a sign when you go around in the buildings and so on. And you should not be afraid, or you should teach your employees not to be afraid to go up to a person and say, hey, what is your business here? Because we fool people so often with the, and the only reason that we are able to do that is because people are so polite. They will not go, in, go to a, a person standing in the elevator talking angry in the phone, going with you in the elevator, going up to a certain floor. They will not say, hey, by the way, who are you? If he's talking really angry in the phone. And, and that's where it goes wrong. Anyway, the conclusion is that, that uh, you cannot protect yourself. And, uh, and that is why we developed rapid detection system. And this is actually a, a real life example. So our F-Secure red teaming projects actually led us into thinking that we need to, to come up with a solution that rather than try to protect, because we have now evidence that it's more or less impossible, but a solution that will detect when somebody is hacking you. So what I call it actually our, how many in here has an alarm system in their company? You don't have alarm systems in your company. Okay, anybody having an alarm system at home? Two, three, okay. Uh, and why do we have alarm system at home? Because you are afraid that somebody will break in. What is the likelihood that somebody will break into the company, physically break into the company, versus the likelihood of a hacker breaking into your company? I think the likelihood of a hacker breaking into the company is much bigger. <coughs> Just taking into consideration that you can do it from wherever you are in the world. You can try to break into a company. So that in increases the likelihood. So we, we, uh, we made RDS, our cyber security alarm system, which as mentioned by Miko, have a lot of sensors around the network that can detect if some, something is going on that should not go on. And, and just before we launched the system, Last year, we had one of our old customer uh, that had this issue. And we asked them, hey, by the way, are you interested in, in, in uh, testing this system together with us? And I said, yeah, why not? We have had similar systems, but to be honest, none of them has been able to detect your, your type of attacks. So, so if you now claim that you have built a solution that can can detect the kind of attacks that you are actually doing, these more advanced attacks that a real hacker will do, then, then definitely it's something that would be of interest to us. So we went out there, we deployed the system, putting up the sensors, and went back to our alarm central, where we could look into the, the screens and see if an alarm was triggered. And I think that after a week, we didn't really you know, foresee that anything would happen. It was not running production as such, and no SLA was promised to the customer. It was just to, to get some, you know, data and something to work with. When suddenly there was alarm triggered on, on, the, on the customer's network. And it was a spear phishing mail that was sent to the customer. 
And we was a little bit, you know, everybody's adrenaline like start like, Ooh, what is going on here? So we called the customer up and say, hey, you, you might have a problem. Uh, it looks like somebody has sent you a spear phishing mail. You have to look into it and you need to take proper action to this. And they did and say, okay, this is, uh, this is strange. And we went back a little bit, you know, relaxed and a little bit again. And then after a short while, there was a new attack. And then yet another one. And another one. And we're thinking, oh my God, this is really bad. Called up the customer again and said to them, hey, you are under heavy attack. You need to do something. Maybe you should shut down the entire thing, but something is definitely wrong here. And the customer said, this is really strange. And we asked them, say, by the way, have you ordered somebody to do like a simulated attack to us? No, no, no. We have not ordered anybody to do that. And we went back to our, you know, computers and looked, digged in, like Miku was saying, digging into what, what's, what's really happening here. Where does this attack come from? And after a while, we found out that the attack was coming from one of our competitors. And, and then we called the, the customer again and said, it, it looks like this uh, is coming from uh, one of our competitors. Somebody must has, has been kind of ordering this attack. Not what we know of, but we will ask around internally. And it turned out that the CEO of this company has called up and, and asked them, hey, I would like you to do a simulated attack. I want to see if this solution that we now potentially will buy, and they bought it, by the way, is actually working. So I think that's a force. It was like a, a super test of, of uh, what we have developed. And, and for the customer, also extremely nice that they actually have like proof of concept that it was working. So all these learnings that we get working with the most demanding customer is something that we put into our product development, like the RDS system that I just told you about. We also use it to develop radar. I will say that actually radar was developed on the same philosophy. Maybe with a little bit of another angle that we wanted to automate what we were doing. Instead of doing a lot of manual testing, looking for specific vulnerabilities in the, in the customer network, it was quite boring to do, took far too long time. So we wanted to automate this. And we wanted, we wanted to be you know, done with a scanner. When we invented or not, when we yeah, invented the scanner, there was other scanners on the market at that time. But we couldn't really rely on these scanners. And we couldn't put in the, the vulnerabilities that we found ourselves. We couldn't you know, make a plugin and, and put it into that, their scanner. And we weren't really happy about how they did it. So that's why we invented our own scanner. And that actually gave us the ability to, to put in vulnerabilities that nobody has seen before. Put it into our own scanner so we can, in an automated way, find these, these vulnerabilities for the customer. And just lately, with the announcement of, uh, or the launch of Sense, we have used our capabilities in making hardware secure in the combination with software. So how do F-Secure benefits? Just to wrap it up, I think we F secure benefits a lot from having us working at the absolute forefront of cybersecurity, taking the learnings, putting it into product development. We are actually often used as the spearhead in selling new solutions. And lately, together with Miko, I think we play a significant role in improving the brand. Uh, doing talks at conferences all over the world, mingling with the cybersecurity society. That was all for me.
Uh, I will now hand over the microphone to Jürgen. Thank you, Jens. Yeah, and you need this. So now we're moving from the cybersecurity services to the B2B product section. My name is Jürgen Rosenberg, and I'm the head of the corporate cybersecurity unit. So uh, as some already described in the beginning, the, and Jens was emphasizing, we're learning a lot from the, ex, uh, the larger enterprises, larger customers, and the very demanding customers, and we're benefiting in the product business. I will be describing um, our product evolution, as well as how we are selling and marketing and evolving our channel strategy in the product business based on all of this um, evolution. Uh, but first, uh, let me just remind you of what we really believe our customers need. Um, ultimately, there are, there are three types of um, uh, needs that they have. First of all, they need to protect their data and assets. And increasingly, whether it's for the mentioned uh, legal reasons or for commercial reasons, they need to safeguard their data. Whether it's customer data, employee data, business data, they want to be sure that nobody gets access to that. Obviously, in addition to that, they need to make sure that they can continue to run their business. So the operational continuity, so that nobody has uh, ransomware or other attacks that is stopping from running their business. But then finally, and uh, increasingly in the market, as also Jens was highlighting, they do want to know if somebody has in fact already penetrated their network and is able to access something, because increasingly, the attackers don't make a huge noise about the attack immediately. So rather than just blocking viruses, malware, or widely and rapidly spreading uh, ransomware, uh, the companies of all sizes increasingly want to understand that has someone actually already hacked us, even if we're not seeing it immediately. And doing this is more demanding and more complex and requires small intelligence, human intelligence, artificial intelligence, and more data about what's going on in the customers' networks. Um, when I now go into the product description, I'll start from the end point. And um, as you might be aware of, F-Secure uh, for decades has been known to be a world-leading uh, endpoint um, provider when it comes to the reliability. No other company has won the AV test as many times as we have. So when it comes to this core technology capability that has been a big part of our business for many, many years, we are world class, no doubt about that. But it's not only the antivirus uh, technology. This area of our business, the endpoint protection, has grown both in terms of uh, the size of the business, but very much as well as the uh, breadth of the technology. What all we do? I'm not going to go through all of these areas, but just, just to give you an idea of what all the modern endpoint does and what F-Secure's endpoint does. It, it, it makes sure you have the latest software across your network and assets, helps you patch it, and, and um, some of the new next generation endpoint providers are very proud about their artificial intelligence or behavioral analyses, uh, types of capabilities in the endpoint. We've been doing that for a decade as well. So our endpoint not only is the most reliable, but is also a very, very comprehensive suite of technologies uh, nowadays. But as said, it's not only about protecting the endpoint. Increasingly, uh, the threats are complex. They vary. Um, they uh, might require contextual understanding so that it's not just protecting one laptop as it used to be. Uh, you need to understand what the hacker is doing in the network and, and be able to relate data from different parts of the company, technical assets to each other. So behavioral analysis and, and artificial intelligence and contextual understanding become much more interest, uh, interesting and important. And for that uh, uh, reason, we have uh, developed and launched and are now successfully selling the F-Secure Rapid Detection Service. Let me really quickly just recap how that system works and then um, move on to the endpoint detection and response that Samu mentioned we're launching next year. So in this um, F-Secure Rapid Detection Service, 
we gather threat intelligence from many, many sources, uh, and then we install sensors and other technology to our customer networks and assets, and we collect huge amounts of data all the time. Massive amounts of data, then, that, then we uh, process in our cloud um, and uh, relate different events to each other, whether it's about um, behavior of the user, also assets, or, or anything, anything suspicious or unusual that, that might happen. And increasingly, we're investing in artificial intelligence to do this. So we're really combining man and machine to have the highest level of, um, of understanding of what's going on in the customer network. And now, we are already selling successfully uh, that as a managed service. So that's the F-Secure Rapid Detection Service, where we have uh, our specialists 24-7 monitoring what's going on in the customer network, and we're giving a very, very high level of service, uh, notifying the customer immediately. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a high-end service to demanding customers. And that has been, a, with that technology, we've been able to really test our capabilities and be sure that when we then scale this to a more automated world and to smaller customers, still we're not compromising on the quality of this capability. And I'm happy to say that, um, as Jens was also describing this customer case, the, the level of detection and our ability to detect and respond has been very, very high. Next year, when we're launching this more automated version of it, the um, um, endpoint uh, detection and uh, response uh, solution, so EDR um, uh, in short, uh, we're able to scale this business model and this technology to smaller customers. So the way to do it is to automate a lot of the processes and, and to integrate it into our channel and into our uh, endpoint product offering uh, in a way that lets smaller companies also benefit from this enterprise-grade capability. What that means in practice is things like visualization, automation, so that uh, whoever is running uh, the company's IT assets, whether it's the partner or someone in the smaller company themselves, there's less manual work, they don't have to rely on us calling them, but the system automatically takes action for them and also in an easy to understand way shows what's going on. So if there's an attack, they can in a visual way see what's going on and, and uh, the system can automatically block some elements of the network or the assets um, and, and all the partner who's managing this or the customer itself has to do is to take choices of what level of automation they want and where they want to be uh, personally involved and what they want the system to do automatically. So that's going to be a really, really key launch for us next year and will help us scale this technology to the lower end uh, from, the, from the demanding um, bigger customers and, and that way capture more share in the mid-market. So then uh, that really means we have two very concrete growth opportunities ahead of us. One is uh, increasing the size of our endpoint mark, uh, uh, business in the, in the mid-market by introducing the EDR solution on top of our endpoint solution or on top of someone else's endpoint solution. And in addition to that, we can grow our business by growing the managed version of this service as we're doing already today. So both of, growing both of these solutions is, is a key focus area for us in 2018. So really, with that launch next year, we have a very holistic uh, portfolio of services that is uh, optimized to serve the mid-market. We have the endpoint that is much more than a traditional endpoint. We have the detection and response solutions, both automated as well as managed version. We have vulnerability assessment. And to improve all of this, both for the customers and for our own products, we have the cybersecurity services available uh, for us. So really a very holistic mid-market optimized portfolio of products and solutions. Now let me move uh, a little bit to the customer side. So what are we doing in sales and marketing with the channel and how do we uh, uh, improve execution there as well? I'll start with another um, customer example. Jens was describing a case where 
we were installing our rapid detection service to a customer and the customer had ordered someone else to hack it, someone else to do red teaming. In this particular case, we had a customer who had been our customer in the endpoint detection for, uh, for many years. Uh, but um, that relationship that we had helped us to uh, sell more um, services to them as well, including red teaming. Uh, and it turns out that our red teaming showed um, lack of capabilities in another product that they were using. So we were able to notify them um, um, uh, or, or basically uh, uh, bypass another system, that, um, a, de a detection and response system that they had. So in a way, whether it is someone else red teaming our solution or, or us red teaming someone else's solution, it turns out we are winning business and having new opportunities. Um, so we believe that the, solu the, the portfolio of solutions is really giving us um, uh, synergies and as Samu said in his presentation, this cross-sell and upsell in the slightly larger customers is really a big business driver for us in the future. Um, Building on that point, let me talk a little bit about our channel strategy and also the synergies that we have. So, as I said, mentioned already, we're focused on mid-market. That is a gradual shift uh, from the small and medium-sized enterprises. So we have a lot of small customers that we serve through our wide uh, channel network currently. And we are having increasingly uh, smaller, uh, sorry, big, bigger customers in the mid-market. And... Um, in the portfolio, we have the endpoint protection service that serves really well, SMBs as well as mid-market. And then we have the managed detection service that is clearly geared towards slightly bigger customers. Now when we launch EDR next year in the middle, the endpoint detection response solution, we have two really nice synergies for ourselves here. One is the technology synergy between EDR and RDS, i.e. the endpoint detection resp uh, and response solution as well as our current uh, managed uh, detection service. So we don't have to build the technology base twice. So we can scale our current capabilities to the smaller customers with the launch of EDR. The other nice synergy is more on the sales channel and customer size. The EDR solution that we're launching is, is a product that will fit very nicely to the smaller customers that we have. So the whole over 6,000 um, partners that we have and over 100,000 customers that we have, increasing amount of those can now benefit from this advanced technology because we can use the same channel structure to that. We are shifting our channel somewhat to um, um, uh, mid-market and bigger customers as well, but we we believe we can nicely um, leverage the existing channel for the EDR more than we can with the managed system today. And then finally on this one, really the, the channel structure focus. So a lot of SMB resellers currently, some uh, value-added resellers and, um, and uh, managed service providers, uh, with these new solutions, the shift is towards the middle here. And, um, and, and uh, partners that can also serve bigger customers. What makes us really good for these value-added resellers and MSPs as well, in addition to the SMB resellers that we have, is the fact that they can build value on top of our solutions. So whether it's the endpoint protection or our detection and response solutions, we bring a lot of value to the customers and the end customers, but we also enable our partners to do so. Already today in our endpoint solution, uh, many of our partners have additional business from planning, implementation, operational management, as well as malware response. And in the detection and response area, they can build even more additional business to themselves. We have very, very good discussions with many of our partners about both rapid detection service as well as our upcoming um, EDR launch, because they believe they can add more value whether it's incident management, threat hunting, or, or these operational and planning services that they have. So that's a very, very uh, good way to go to market, uh, towards the mid-market. Then finally, just a couple of words about our competitive situation. We have, we have really optimized our portfolio 
uh, for the meat market and selected areas that we believe support each other. And if we look at our competition, there are the more traditional players that are more focused on the endpoint and are trying to expand uh, to uh, uh, newer solutions. And then we have some players that have started from the detection and response, whether it's managed or automated, but some of them lack, uh, lack of uh, the basic foundation of world-class um, EPP solutions. We believe that we are, co uh, we are really serving all the most relevant and necessary elements for the mid-market customers and can hence compete effectively uh, with, uh, with many players in this focus segment of ours. So to recap our biggest focus areas next year and beyond, we will be accelerating the sales of our uh, uh, RDS solution the managed version of the detection, uh, detect, detect and the response solution. Next year we will be launching the EDR solution with much more automation with the same enterprise grade capability but now in a more scalable way through our existing channels and, uh, and new channel partners as well. And this way we will be strengthening our focus in the mid-market in a way moving slightly up in the market size or more customer size and then very, very importantly, increasing the cross-sell and upsell in our customers and doing it by having a more integrated um, uh, suite of, uh, of solutions. So that's my summary of the B2B product business. Um, over to Tapio. Yes, thank you, Jyrki. And thank you, Jens. And now we'll have a quick break and then we'll continue with the program afterwards. Thank you. Okay, so now welcome back from the break and now we'll uh, delve into the interesting world of consumer security with Christian. Good morning everybody, I think, still think that we can call this a morning even though we're closing noon. So I will uh, spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about the consumer security business. How do we see the markets and channels and what, what is the outlook for our portfolio? And, and how, how do consumers view the world today? So just a few words uh, in the beginning about the synergies between consumer and the rest of the business-to-business -business operations that the company has. Obviously, we've heard pretty exciting things about the B2B side, the corporate and, and cybersecurity businesses. And, and I'm equally excited about the things that the, the B2B people are on our development on this uh, detection and response thing because that's actually one of the examples of the synergies that we can have as a company. We can take that technology down and, and trickle it down to, to serve also the consumer business. Now on, on, on synergies uh, there's also very significant uh, upside potential for the cooperation between our consumer business and the cyber security consulting because Every, anything and everything that CSS people do to detect new advanced threats is actually fed into the same security cloud that is benefiting every single consumer when they use F Secure Safe, as an example. Furthermore, uh, we have a significant operator business, and uh, cybersecurity consultants from F Secure helped to develop our Sense product, but we can also help our operator partners to harden their uh, router products the products that they ship to all of their customers. So, so there are a lot of synergy opportunities between the business units. We and the whole industry started from protecting PCs. Mikko told a nice uh, story about how everything began plus 20, 20 years ago, and it all started from AV, and we protected PCs. Now, this traditional AV business is actually, or traditional PC protection business is, is as relevant as it has ever, ever been now that ransomware has become a professional, profitable line of business for criminals. So it is really, really relevant still today. Uh, we did expand from PCs to cover also mobile devices. That's, that's a huge, huge uh, growth opportunity for the security, or has been a good growth opportunity before the security business. And now we're not, yet, when we talk about protection, we're not even talking about PCs versus mobiles. We're talking about multi-device. 
the expectation is that all, all devices are protected. Uh, a few years back, uh, understanding of the, secure, of the privacy issues became mainstream uh, due to Edward Snowden revelations. People became more and more aware of the privacy topics. Uh, we just this week, for example, had some news about how uh, Russia is now violating people's privacies by banning the use of VPN. But we also saw some disturbing news some months ago in the US where FCC, the regulator, telecom regulator, uh, made it possible again for the telecom operators or ISPs to sell data about the use of internet. So we actually saw a nice uptick in, in our sales in US for our freedom product. Parents are increasingly worried about the perils of, of the open internet of the security for, for their kids. They really want to have some understanding and, and, uh, of, of what their kids are doing. They want to be able to set some rules on, on what is the right amount of screen time per day and what kind of content they can access through the web. So the topic of parental control, or like we want to talk about it as, as family rules, is becoming more and more important and relevant to parents and, and uh, the, the markets overall. And lastly, but not least, uh, IoT security. I mean, that's a huge emerging trend. And, and we see that as something which is a natural evolution from PCs to mobiles to all connected devices. There are many estimations on how many IoT gadgets are being used in homes in, in 2020 or beyond. Whatever the number is, is, or whatever will be the right figure, it will be huge. And we're talking about the things like you know, smart fridges, smart toasters, and et cetera, which people are not necessarily relating to that much. But how many of you have a smart TV at home? I didn't see anybody who didn't raise a hand. Many of you have game consoles. Many of you have, have set-top boxes. These are all smart devices which have no protection whatsoever. And you can't install anything on those. And, and people don't know how to upgrade the firmware of their heat exchange pump either. So there's a huge opportunity over there. So people are hearing a lot about this. There are big news on IoT hacks like Mirai, etc. And they are feeling confused. They are feeling helpless. They want to get peace of mind. And they don't feel that they would be able to do everything that is needed for in, in, in separation, in isolation. Let's do something for my heat exchange pump. And then PCs are th something different. And mobile devices are different. So they want something that will help them to protect their digital lives. Now then, there are a couple of interesting things happening in the channels, in our go-to-market environment. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion at, 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 um, in, the few, in the past about how Windows 10 and, and uh, Microsoft Defender have been really tied, tied together. And uh, there's been discussion about what, what will this mean to the AV business. Well, I can tell you that our renewal rates for SAFE have never, ever been higher. But it has had a significant impact for those whose business model is freemium. Give something for free and then try to do the upselling. So there has been a significant impact on those. So a lot of freemium players are suffering. So someone else is, is potentially grabbing the market that they have had through the conversion to pay. We also see that there is a huge change in the OEM business or pre-installation business. They are big, big players who have made huge amounts of revenue from pre-installations, putting things on PCs and then giving these free trials and then converting those. Well, Microsoft has in introduced something that they call signature edition PCs, which is they incentivize PC manufacturers not to put what they call bloatware onto the devices because they want to be in the same position as Apple who is able to control what is the look and feel of the device when a person gets a new Mac. But when you have bought a Windows device, it hasn't looked the same as Microsoft has designed. Therefore, they are incentivizing PC manufacturers not to put stuff on the devices. Therefore, they launched their own 
PC line of products. So there's a shift from that paid security market to some other channels. Uh, there's a big change taking place in retail. Some of our big, big competitors have been really retail channel dependent. And they are because of the reasons that we see in other categories as well. We see big brick and mortar players having a hard time fighting against e-commerce. And that's happening in our world as well. I mean, which one is easier to, to sell clothes over, over the web or to sell bits over the web? Obviously, it's the bits. So retail has been suffering, and we see that many players are pulling back from that. And, and both that the trend of the retail business overall as a channel going down is a good thing for us, but also this defocus has, has opened up some opportunity pockets for us, especially in the Nordic markets, where we have actually been able to swim against the current. And then obviously app stores are growing, but what has been extremely resilient is the operator business. Operators are really, really well positioned to be the managed security service providers for their consumers, to help the consumers to get simplicity back, to be able to get the peace of mind back, and to be able to advise them on what is the way that you should go ahead protecting your full digital life instead of single devices or single use scenarios. So operator business is extremely resilient. Now just to recap on, on the products that we have. F-Secure Safe is our endpoint protection product. It's not just AV, like our endpoint protection on, on the corporate side, it has many more functions. Browsing protection, uh, banking protection, parental control or family rules. F-Secure Key is our password protection product that has absolutely fantastic NPS figures. People love it. It helps them to manage their passwords, making it possible not to use the same password in every single service that you have, but to really use complex, pass complex and secure passwords which are individual to a, to a service that you're using. F-Secure Freedom, our VPN and privacy product, is also absolutely loved by the users. It provides uh, not just uh, privacy for you, but it also protects you when you are using public Wi-Fi. It ensures that no one is snooping, snooping your traffic, which is a real potential threat. We've made, in some public events, we've made these kind of stunts where we are showing to people how, peop how, how we, anybody can track your traffic if, if you're using a free Wi-Fi. Actually, these are not our only products. We have great channels. Telecom operators and, and uh, also direct business, we are actually having a lot of business support systems that support our channels. So it's not just about the excellence in the products, it is about excellence in how do we go to market with partners and, and through our own ecom activities. When we talk about the operator business, which is the biggest bulk of the, of the consumer business, we are number one in the world in selling security for consumers through operators. That's the, that's, that's the thing where we are the absolute market leader, but that's also, also the thing where we are absolutely the best in the world. We are working with operators looking at the security in, 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 in a way where they can solve the security issues to their consumers on three layers. First, endpoint protection, which is obviously our home turf. That's, that's the domain which is our traditional business. That's the thing where we are really, really strong. It is still absolutely the best way to, to, to uh, secure your devices and yourself. It works whenever, wherever you are. The, the challenge for some of the operators is how do I get all of my customers to install the endpoint protection? So, so it's not a question of whether it adds value, it is a question, how do I cover all of my end users? And some of them have re, um, gone out with some network-based security solutions, which is easy to deploy. If you're a mobile operator and you put the network security thing in place, you know that every single customer that is using your network is covered. But it's also having some, some very ser serious flaws it might give you a false sense of safety when in fact it's not working only in your network but if you're using a Wi-Fi it doesn't work or if you're using services over HTTPS encrypted traffic it's not working. 
So actually, endpoint protection and network security go really well hand in hand. And actually, endpoint protection, uh, network protection solutions can be used to remind people of installing endpoint protection as well. Both of these approaches have one caveat. It is that you can't protect devices in your home where you can't install anything, and network solution on the, on the other side can't see anything behind the router. So for that purpose, you need protection on the router space. And this is perhaps the, the, the segment of the market which is emerging now really strongly. So in addition to launching our own Sense product, we're having a lot of discussions with operators about taking the Sense functionality or a subset of that and embedding that to operator routers. We have fantastic products that we, we and our end users love and we are really, really proud of them. But when we talk with the operators, I'm, I'm always saying that that's not actually the thing that makes us different from everybody else in the markets. The real differentiator is that our whole business model is about making the operators successful themselves. So driving the operator success. We are not about signing a contract, putting our product onto your shelf. We are about driving together the whole sales process. Starting from how do we target the customers? What are the right value propositions? What kind of activities have worked best across the 200 operators that we are working with to drive traffic to your website? What, how do we ensure that the customer journey is, is, simp is as simple as possible? How do we ensure that there are not too many steps and the messages that you are seeing are such that people will continue to the next step and they will complete the whole journey? We have tons of experience in that and we have known for a long time what works and what doesn't intuitively. But we have added during the last year a lot of new capabilities which is turning us from being great artists into being data-driven scientists. So we have added analytics and we can do A-B testing and we can say that this font size in your message works better than that. This picture is better than that. So we are really helping our partners to drive their business. And then when you have sold a subscription to a person, we are having lifecycle messaging capabilities where we can tell people that, hey, you have installed only one of your three licenses. Why don't you install it to another device? Why don't you install it to a third device? And by the way, you have now used all of your licenses. Would you like to get a larger license size? It costs you only this much and you can extend it to all of your devices. And then obviously the next thing is talking about cross-selling. You have already ha purchased this, would you like to have password protection? Would you like to have VPN and privacy and so on and so forth? So a lot of capabilities which are about the business process, not about just the product. And I've often said that you know, if, if you're an operator and you would like to grow a security business, you shouldn't go to McKinsey or Accenture you should come to F-Secure because we are the guys who have the data, we are the go guys who know how to make this happen. A couple of real life case examples. So we're driving business outcomes for our partners. So obviously we are very interested in them building a big consumer security business. But we can demonstrate some, some successes also in their core services. So we have, for example, a case example where an operator started to offer what they called secure broadband. So any time that customer called a call center and, and said that it, they would be interested in the broadband services, part of the sales pitch was, would you like to have broadband or would you like to have secure broadband? And what happened is that their sales started to go up. So they were able to sell more sub subscriptions. Also, we see results where after we have worked on the customer journey improvements, we have 40 to 60% increase in the activation levels, which is good business already. And it's good business obviously for us. But if it increases their NPS figures with 10 to 15 points, which is a huge increase for anybody who, who knows about telecom where the NPS figures can be negative, 
it does result in a significantly better stickiness of the core services. So those customers who are using security are much, much less likely to churn from the core services. So you can just imagine you sell more of your core services and you have better retention. What is the business value of that? So it goes far beyond just the security revenue. Now direct business, direct business for us means our own e-commerce where we sell HP, uh, where, we, where we sell um, our, our products through uh, our own e-commerce web, web pages and uh, uh, using our own brand. And then we are working actively with uh, retailers and e-tailers. That has had 10 quarters of consecutive quarters of accelerated growth, which is really, really fantastic. Now, the drivers for this success are, are, there are many drivers for that success. So it's not a silver bullet. It is about this operational excellence, doing well in many, many fronts. So it is about partially the increasing demand for privacy and, and, and multi-device uh, protection. That's, that's one growth driver. Uh, we have been quite successful with a very cost-efficient new customer acquisition. We have, after this new customer acquisition, we have been increasingly successful leveraging the data-driven things to convert any trial users into paid users. And we have been increasingly successful in getting people to renew their contracts. So the renewal percentages, even with SAFE, despite the things that are happening in the free space, SAFE is enjoying the highest ever renewal rates. And, so, and, and we have good renewal rates for other products as well. And with a combination of, of, of these and increasing the average revenue per user, we have seen some really, really nice offerings. So we are using bundling of the products and upselling to drive the average revenue per user and, and see good results there. Now, just a few words about bundling. So we introduced about a year ago something we called uh, F-Secure Total. And, and Total is a commercial bundle of SAFE and Freedom. And you can see, you don't have the absolute numbers, but you can see what is the impact or in, ter in terms of the average revenue per user. So every customer that gets Total instead of SAFE is a much more valuable customer for us. Another interesting thing is that this multi-device thing has really taken off. Beginning of this year, 30% of the devices that were protected, and this is not just DB, this is all of the devices. 30% of the devices were mobile, and now the figure is 43. That's a very remarkable change. So it means that people are using higher number of devices, which means that probably their license packs are starting to be fairly full, which pro probably will provide us a little bit more opportunities for upselling. But that's a very, very healthy development. And then last but not least, our newest baby, our newest product, F-Secure Sense. Was, uh, started, we started the shipments in June. And we have been actually more focused on, on the feedback from the markets than the actual sales figures, because it is a, relative, it, it is a completely new category. But the feedback is really, really good. I mean, nobody likes usually to be called stupid, but someone saying that it's stupidly simple to set up is a big, big compliment. And what I'm also really happy about is that these are actually, I would say, even though they are recent, they are old. Because every week, Sometimes every day, we are adding new capabilities to send. So we are adding a lot of capabilities. And some of the capabilities that were requested by these reviewers are already out there. So the product is getting better and better all the time. And one thing that I would also like to highlight is that when we started to develop Sense, we actually didn't know that, that in, in, in addition to delivering a security router, a big thing is that we did deliver a secure router. Now, Mikko talked about Mirai. One of the biggest contributors to Mirai attack was actually unsecured routers. If you go out to any retail outlet, you can find big brand name uh, products that are using old versions of Linux and so on and so forth. So, routers in general are not very 
well protected. Updating them is very difficult, where a sense updates itself automatically. You might have seen about, uh, news about a VPA2 uh, vulnerability that was out there. We, we are very happy to say that there is no vulnerable sense device out there because every single product is updated and every single new product that is in the channel that might not have the re most recent updates will, as part of the uh, uh, starting cycle, update itself. So it is a secure security router. Very good feedback. So if we look at the competition, we have a very competitive portfolio. And we are really looking at not just individual products, but we are looking at the power of portfolio. With SAFE, we share the same award-winning technology as, as our commercial, uh, 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 as our B2B colleagues. So winning uh, Best Protection Award five times out of six is something that nobody else has been able to do. So it is a very, very robust product. Uh, it is optimized uh, also for the operator channel. Freedom is consistently listed in the top of any VPN review for its ease of use and for its very good capabilities. And F-Secure Sense, as said just a few minutes ago, has received really, really good reviews uh, from, from the markets, uh, from uh, uh, journalists and, and people who do testing of these products. And in addition to having these individual products, we are really working hard to provide a seamless portfolio experience. So we're really building a portfolio where it's, it's the, the value of that is bigger than the, the value of the individual parts. So a lot of synergy potential out there and a lot of opportunities for helping these confused consumers to get a one-stop shop for solving all of their needs in their digital lives. So moving ahead, our focus areas in the consumer security is to continue with solid performance and healthy profitability. We are working hard to increase the revenue per user and to do more upselling. And as said earlier, seamless portfolio experience is really high on our agenda. And so is capitalizing on the emerging IoT security world where a big part of that play is going to be working together with operator partners to bring these capabilities to their products. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Now that we've heard inspiring business cases from our business heads, the next question is show me the money. So then we have Erika who will explain how all this that we've heard is now reflected in our uh, financials. Go ahead, Erika. Thanks. So, Erika Söderström, and I'm pretty sure that after all these uh, interesting presentations, you are willing to see also the numbers behind and, and how, how do those reflect uh, the plans that we have. So let's get started and I thought that you know let's uh, have a look at a bit longer horizon. So I picked up here uh, 10 years. Uh, so the company turns next year 30 years old. But so already in the past 10 years uh, we can identify uh, three different phases. So the first phase uh, from 2008 until uh, 2012, uh, we were growing uh, revenues uh, by 9%. And you can see that it was a consumer business, uh, which was strong and growing. Uh, our business to business, our corporate business uh, was uh, pretty uh, flat at, at that time. And 2009, um, we acquired a company and went to the content cloud business. And that's a phase two. So there you can see the time and, and this uh, gray color on top of the uh, bar, the content cloud uh, growing all the way. Uh, 19 million was the highest on 2013, the revenues. And then declining here, 2015, we divested uh, that business. And naturally, that had an impact then on the overall revenue numbers of F-Secure uh, during that time frame from 2012 to 2015. So revenues declined by 2%. In the same time, uh, in the second phase, you can also see that the consumer business 
was stabilizing. So the strong growth uh, had slowed down, and in the same time, the business to business was still like, you know, not the focus and, and was still remaining approximately in the same level as it had been, slightly declining from the highest in 2009. And then we come to the third phase. Uh, the third phase uh, where the company made a strategy change 2015 and, and decided to start focusing on business to business. And uh, there was an uh, acquisition of a cybersecurity consulting company uh, to start with, and a lot of actions taken since. Um, our revenue uh, official numbers are from 2015, and I need to explain a bit about the gray one because it's not official naturally. So the gray bar here is like a, not an estimate, but just to be on the safe side. So three quarters are for this year, actuals, and then the fourth quarter from last year. So uh, that's where you get 168, uh, but with that revenue, the growth uh, for the whole company showing 6%. But I think the key here is that, you know, in the recent uh, years, the investments in B2B have resulted now with a um, uh, compound average uh, growth rate of 15%. And you will see now going forward also in the other slides uh, how we are making heavy investments. Sometimes we use the word investment in the wrong way. But, you know, when we talk about investments, we talk about increasing the spend in certain operating expense item. So not to confuse you. But on this slide as well, uh, so let's look at the EBIT. So EBIT is this bubble here uh, at the bottom. And you see that a software business been able to create a good healthy profits. Uh, and then now after starting to uh, invest in B2B, uh, seen a decline there, but that is something that we have chosen. It's not happening to us, but uh, we have chosen that we want to see uh, the business to business to capture the growth opportunity that is there. And our guidance for this year, the number here is based on the same kind of calculation that I described for the revenue, i.e. taking the 2016 fourth quarter. But actually, because we are investing for the growth, uh, our guidance since February has remained the same. And we say that we estimate the EBIT for this year uh, to be between 8 uh, to 12 million euros. You might challenge that, how come don't you know at this stage of the year exactly what it is? And I can tell you the secret that in this software business, kind of like, you know, the last weeks of the year are very important. You know, a lot of deals are closed then, and unfortunately it also means that the visibility from that perspective for the new deals is not that strong. But we have uh, pretty good forecasting capabilities and and this is our EBIT guide there's no reason to change that but if you're wondering like you know why are we not squeezing it so revenue has been the number that you see and uh, this chart uh, gives you a flavor looking at the quarterly trends and if we look at the consumer revenue we know that it has been like you know following the market recently low single digit growth uh, from the revenue perspective. And when we look at the uh, business to business revenue, it seems to be uh, fluctuating more. And first of all, I need to mention that uh, acquisition uh, made in 2015, uh, that makes that high peak there. And also the seasonality that you can see uh, the revenue in Q3 has been uh, lower also last year. And so the total revenue uh, growth here, 2% for consumer in Q3, 11% for business to business, and 6% for the total group. And we have been highlighting, please look at the deferred revenue as well. So because that highlights somehow uh, what is happening in the orders, because we have not disclosed the orders. And we are not starting to uh, report orders at, that po at this point either, but I'm still trying to give you a flavor because it is so important that you understand how our orders are coming in and how they actually convert to revenues, especially when there's going to be a change in the IFRS 15, as you know, 
uh, from the beginning of next year, and which will then touch these numbers as well. So uh, I'm spending some time with this one. This might be a bit technical accounting, the next slides, but please bear with me. Hopefully it's useful for you to better understand how we are doing, okay? So uh, this is a picture about our order intake uh, development on quarterly basis. And as you can see, on the y-axis, I don't have the numbers because, you know, we are not at this point uh, reporting those externally. But uh, the bars are reflecting uh, the euro value of the orders. You can see the seasonality there. And the colors, the blue is for the consumer business. And to look at the business to business, you have to look both the red and the gray color. Because we have split the red to present endpoint protection products for B2B, and then the new products for B2B with gray. And if we start here as well, uh, looking at first the consumer. So the order intake uh, growth uh, comparing year and year quarters. So you can see that the similar kind of trend as with the revenues we saw was happening now uh, for the consumer business here. And then when we look at the B2B fluctuation, uh, but then we can also see that this is higher uh, than the revenue numbers. And looking at uh, Q3, we did mention that our order intake was stronger than the sales that we saw in Q3, and our orders uh, were 20% growth uh, in Q3 this year. And if I then uh, try to look at the business to business, uh, how is that developing from the orders perspective? The number would get very big if I included uh, the acquisition here. That's the reason why I chose to start from here um, and come out with a KGAR for business to business in this time period of 20%. So the actions that we are taking, the focus we are making, we start seeing results, but you know, we want to accelerate. We want to be stronger. And I try to explain to you how do you see this in our profit and loss statement because order intake is not uh, the set of numbers uh, that we are officially reporting. So I promised that I'll go technical, so now I'll go. So uh, looking at the revenue recognition. So the significant share of the revenue uh, gets periodized over the duration of the contract already today and even more next year with the IFRS 15. And let me explain first how is it today, and then I'll explain to you what is changing. So let's start now first on the right-hand side and start with the consumer business. So on the operator business, the orders, uh, they convert to revenue uh, almost immediately, I would say. We have quarterly billings and we book that for as revenue. Uh, the direct business that Christian was talking about uh, is mainly deferred. And what does this mainly mean? So we do have an upfront element of the order that we book as revenue, and then the rest will be deferred across the time of the contract duration. And this uh, share of up, uh, the amount of upfront differs from one product to another, because that would be your question, how much do we do it? Same kind of logic is currently valid for business-to-business -business software. So we get an order, we get one chunk as revenue immediately, but the rest gets deferred over the uh, duration of the contract. And for the service part, um, those contracts are normally when they are like shorter, uh, so let's say one month projects, uh, they get converted to revenue uh, immediately when we have delivered them. Uh, in those cases where uh, a service project would be longer by nature, then we need to use percentage of completion. But those are rare. All right, so this is a current uh, way how we recognize revenue. And just taking some like uh, calculation that how does it now turn, looking at the cumulative nine months orders so about 60% of the, uh, those convert to revenue immediately, 
and 40% uh, gets deferred in our, uh, booked in our balance sheet and then across the timeline. And how long are these contracts? They differ a lot. So there's not one uh, single number that I could give to you here because when we look at these different uh, kind of customer cases, uh, there are different, different durations, but the longest ones can be even five years. But let's say two, about two years, what would you say? Approximately two would be maybe the number uh, to be used if you want to have some idea. And now, next year, uh, you know, all the companies are going through the same pain of IFRS 15 and, and looking at how does it change their financials, and you need to then understand that what happened. So, in our case, where is it now? Am I missing a slide here? I seem to be missing a slide, but let me talk it through. Actually, that is in Q3 interim uh, report. It's exactly the same text. But, and I was not planning to read it, so I can tell you about it. Uh, so what is happening uh, is that from the 1st of Jan, uh, we have to apply for this. So currently, we are looking at uh, the booked orders and looking at our balance sheet, doing a lot of recalculations to understand how does this now impact us. And in these cases where we are having an upfront element, i.e. here and here, uh, in those cases, uh, we will be not be booking any upfront anymore, but it will be deferred evenly over the time. This is IFRS language, over the time. So two-year contract divided by 24 months, da, 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 da. that's how we get to see the revenue. And the same applies So in both of these cases. It means that we will see a bit more delayed revenue coming from these, while uh, the operator side, even if I say here, it converts to revenue immediately. Uh, we, in fact, do have some old contracts. And let me give you an example that, you know, we have a three-year contract with an operator, and the first year is with a lower price. So actually, the revenue for the first year is lower, and the second and the third are then higher. And in those cases, also, we need to equalize over the time frame of the contract, which means that we can, in a way, pull earlier. And this is not an official statement, and we don't need to give any official statement at this point about the impact, but I can give you my best understanding at this phase of November when we are making these calculations. So it looks like that actually those, are, from the revenue perspective, these changes next year will be netting each other in the total company level, uh, so that I don't see uh, the difference being material. <coughs> Of course, it depends quite a lot on what's going to be the product mix in the bookings of the uh, December month as well. Uh, looking at EBIT, so clearly uh, there also uh, our understanding today is that we seem to be netting each other pretty well. So long story short, IFRS 15 coming. Uh, it's not going to change the overall company numbers but from the revenue numbers, you will see some more, some more like postponing the B2B revenues. And, and the, that could be then on the consumer side slightly earlier, netting each other. And I know there's a pressure for us to look at the order intake if we could start looking at sharing those with you. At this point, we are not. But we, we promise to actively consider that to make your lives easier. Okay? Uh, so let me see, do I miss any other slides here? But okay. So then moving to the, um, our spend side. So let's start from the R&D. So I, I chose here five years just to be logical, even if let's start from the left-hand side. 2013 and 14 have been impacted by content cloud. So from that perspective, uh, it's a bit oddity. But you can see that now we have been increasing uh, our R&D expenses and a new product coming up, it's very important for us to look at the roadmap. But I think what's interesting for you is to look at the capitalization of our R&D. So we are, I would say, pretty conservative, considering the IFRS rules that are available and what, how they can be interpreted. So we have been historically conservative, and as you can see with these numbers, so 
And uh, I don't think that we are going to change, change that. Uh, there will be probably somewhat increase in the ratio uh, for the uh, capitalized part due to the fact that we are uh, developing new commercial products. And I find it difficult not to uh, capitalize certain uh, parts of the projects uh, to follow the rules. Uh, but no major change is coming up in the principle. I think that's a key for you. Um, then looking at the uh, sales and marketing expenses, and you can see that, wow, these guys are really uh, investing a lot to make sure that the sales network is out there. And, and this is part of the story on our EBIT, why we are saying that uh, this year uh, we expect our EBIT to be between 8 to 12 million euros, while last year it was 19 million euros. Because we are now investing both in R&D and sales and marketing, and that said, of course, we had to invest in the rest of the organization as well. For example, we just changed our ERP system. We have a work day. And, and, and preparing us to be stably operating, to be able to grow. So, balance sheet. So we have a strong balance sheet, uh, about 80 million uh, euros cash and available financial assets. Uh, cash flow from operations in this business is uh, strong. Customers typically uh, are willing to pay upfront either the whole lot or a lot uh, compared to many other in industries. And, but of course you here also will see and are seeing the impact from our uh, strong investments for growth. Remember please that there is about 3 million uh, tax related positive this year in those numbers. Uh, equity ratio strong, and as you can see, we don't have debt. And the question is that, okay, how does a profile look like? How would you want to be? I think that we have a strong balance sheet, and as someone was describing, we have appetite for MDA, and we are ready for it. And, and from the operational perspective, I think that you know, we are ramping ourselves also uh, to be able to grow, and um, we have a balance sheet which we can use. Maybe not more, more about that. And then uh, finally, that why is this business of ours at F-Secure attractive? And uh, as Mikko was highlighting in the beginning about the landscape of threats, and some was describing about the markets, so clearly there is strong demand continuing in the future. It's a question of how do we capture that opportunity to be able to accelerate our growth. Looking at the history of the company, almost uh, 30 years next year, it will be the birthday. So we have accumulated a, no a lot of knowledge and we have leading experts in this field. And I think that um, in the interim report, we actually did mention uh, that uh, we were pretty high up in the list for the IT uh, employees. Uh, looking at the favored companies to work for. Of course, that's Finland. Our next step is to be able to also get more and more good talent uh, from other countries. Uh, Jens was talking about our cybersecurity services, uh, the consulting, and I think that makes us different. Um, and we can utilize this con uh, consulting to support our product business. So it comes to the product development, like making sure that we have the latest information and these guys are really like harassing each other all the time, playing different roles. And we have the latest data available to develop our products. And then on the other hand, I feel that um, our cybersecurity consultants do a good job opening up doors uh, for the software sales guys. Not going there directly saying that, you know, I'm selling this, but by the way, would you like to meet my colleague? Because he has a good product, and I know the product well. And it works uh, very well at this stage. And I believe that we can, we can even expand there. Also the fact that we are in software business, and I think it was good, Samu, that you pointed out, that uh, even if we have the service arm, we feel that we are a, a software company. Because the scalability behind the software business model with having high product margins 
is the part that we use when we model our future and see that now we need to invest and now we want to capture the growth. Also in this model, uh, our uh, revenues are recurring. SARS is um, coming up. Uh, it uh, differs from one product to another, uh, like how big a share we have today in SARS model, but clearly that is going to grow. And maybe in the future we can also share a bit more details with you. Uh, but when we look at our license model, so our, when we sell a software license, so it's not a perpetual license, but rather it's a time-based license, one or two or three years, and there's an element of renewal. And uh, we are pretty good at renewing those contracts, uh, following at least, I would say, the uh, industry like uh, averages there. And then there's always opportunity to upsell as well. And I already mentioned um, from the balance sheet perspective that, yes, this is cash generating business. So uh, the terms and conditions are good. I like them. And today, uh, we are in a mode uh, where we want to see that where do we put the money that we, we get the return in the future and not too far but still that we do this in a very controlled manner understanding which steps we take to capture the opportunities that, that we see there and hopefully today you got a bit better understanding about our thinking and what are the plans that we have in mind focus in the mid market maybe to a slightly higher size companies to generate the possibility to have this cross-sell upsell opportunity, having a wider portfolio of products and, and having that uh, easier to use uh, for the customer at the end. And then finally, um, the balance sheet uh, enables the M&A as I, as I mentioned. And I'd love to take the last page and show you our long-term financial targets. But at this stage, I need to tell also that you know, we are in process or crystallizing our strategy. Now you have gotten a good um, idea, so uh, what we are working on, and, and the, it's not finalized yet. So uh, within the next uh, one to two months, I think that uh, we will uh, finalize the discussions with the board and, and also can agree about long-term financial targets for the company, and, and we are willing to share those with you when we come out in February uh, with our year-end result. It would have been great to take them here but you have to be patient and, and wait until February. So that's all from me, from my side, but I think it's time for questions and answers, and I give this to someone. He can direct the Yes, thank there. you, Erika. So with that, then we start uh, the concluding Q&A session, and there's already a question here, so maybe I won't even start myself. Hi, <coughs> Rao Atleman from Danske Bank. <coughs> Uh, one of my questions would have been the financial targets and how you how you see your your growth in the future. But I guess we have to wait until February and hopefully we will hear something about the growth targets. But then about the investments, I mean, you've invested now for two years, and uh, just hearing you talk, I'm assuming that you will also continue in 2018. But I, what I would like to hear is what are you focusing now in your investments? I mean, you invested in R&D and sales already, but uh, what's next? Yes. Yeah. So the I think the investor investment profile will stay roughly the same, and, and and perhaps what we try to convey with our strategy focus is that it's really looking into areas where we can uh, complement, uh, build adjacent products to this mid-market offering. So continue investing in the product capabilities there and uh, definitely continue investing in sales and marketing. And with sales and marketing, I, I think we, we really want to be laser focused on, on mid-market and on laser focused on, on, on some key geographies. So we try to be very cautious not to spread our investments too, too thinly. So for us, I guess the, the focus is really what we are, we are trying to live. So did that answer it? So SME related portfolio, and SME-related uh, sales and marketing, and maybe maybe even further so in the sales and marketing, really focusing on this, what we, 
we sometimes internally use a category that we've in invented ourselves. We call it XDR. So XDR in F-Secure books is EDR, which we will be launching next year, the fully automated pure play technology for detection, and also RDS, which has the service component. So these two combined with the services is what we call XDR. So really sales focus on XDR. Okay, then. Mikael Raudren, Inderes. Uh, your consulting business, because uh, like you are, your DNA is a product company. So is it a weakness that uh, in your consulting business that you are not technology independent? So you go to, go to the customer with, with F-Secure product while your competitors go there and look at the problem. Well, this or this or this technology would be best for your problem or is, it, is there a problem? It, it sometimes is. Uh, I want to be very frank with that. But we, I think that there are so many different versions of what you can look at, what cybersecurity consulting could, could include. And one example, what you refer would be a consultant who goes there and is a helping hand for a customer when they are trying to go and select what would be the best possible product. So this consultant is helping there to evaluate different technologies. We are not trying to engage that type of a consulting gig, so it's not therefore a weakness. It's a game that we are not playing at all. So we are much more in this, I would say, problem-solving mindset. So when customer is being breached, we, we do the forensics, we do incident response. When customer wants to test their cyber resilience, we do red teaming. So really areas where this uh, product uh, being product agnostic is, is, is not on the play. And there are some other cybersecurity companies who really try to position themselves as a technology agnostic, but I don't see us competing head to head against those guys with those sort of assignments. So as an example, there could be a company who positions themselves a bit more in a service provider play, and then they would say that, hey, we are providing you this service, you don't need to worry about technology. We always pick and choose whatever we think it is the best. That's not our game. Our game is that we provide you rapid detection service, and it comes from F-Secure, as an example. So we are not positioning into that game. So. Yeah. Hi, Matti Rikonen, Carnegie. Um, I would like to go back to your corporate business, and uh, I was just wondering that you talked quite a lot about having this uh, uh, split between uh, SMB business, mid-market mm -hmm. as the new focus area, also the enterprise business. But you haven't really talked about how much your current business is in these boxes at the moment. So I was wondering, is it very far off to assume that you would still have maybe 85% of your business in the small company segment, then maybe 10% in mid-market and 5% in enterprise. So that's first question. And the next is that where would you see that uh, those numbers to be in, let's say, five years' time when, when you obviously get going with, with your strategy and probably the mid-market and enterprise segments are having a larger share of your sales at the moment? Very good. So we don't disclose that, that split. I can try to offer some color. I, I tried to offer some color when I was speaking about that. So our past, if I go three, four years back, it really would be a consumer-centric comp company, and the B2B business was really like geared towards small businesses. So I would say uh, lower end of mid-market or even small companies. And, and during the last two years, we tried to already move more towards, I would say, the, the center of a mid-market. And we are not right there yet. And, uh, and this is more of an ambition kind of that really, really want to be in the mid-market and scaling upwards towards upper end of the mid-market that we don't see ourselves aiming for enterprise. But I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not offering a precise data point for that, but maybe some, some idea that still I think our past is a lot about smaller companies where we wish to be. 
And your second question was, uh, did you? In five years' time. Oh, I think I answered that. So in five years' time, we really want to be like really, really known as the, the, the hero of, of, of mid, mid market. That, that's why we are CEF secure. And we, we really need to see also mid market extended more towards a little bit bigger companies because there's, there is no industry definitions what is mid market. Some, some other vendor would say that to us, mid market ends at uh, 500. Uh, people, companies, and beyond that is enterprise. Some might think F Secure, we are a bit more than 1,000 people. To some, we might be an enterprise. But we really want to extend that mid market so it also includes companies that are a few thousands of people because we want to be able to offer the full portfolio, the endpoint protection, detection, vulnerability management, and selected set of cybersecurity services. And for that full portfolio coverage to yield the full potential of cross-sell, you cannot focus on companies that are 200, 300, 400 people. So you look at companies that are maybe more uh, size-wise look like F-Secure, like, like ourselves. Yes, Mikael again. Um, about the operator business from a uh, big picture perspective a little bit. Uh, can you help me understand, does uh, convergence of different network technologies like cable converging with telcos, telcos converging with mobile, and operators merging with each other, how does that play into your operator business? Is it a threat, is it a opportunity, or is it irre irrelevant? It's more irrelevant than a threat. Uh, there are some examples like given that we have such a monstrous market share in that arena, like having about 200 operator partners. So the telecom industry has been going through a lot of consolidation. And what we've seen practically pretty much every case is that when two telcos merge, it's very often that either one of them was, was our customer. And, and in the cases where the other one wasn't, it was very clear to the combined entity that who would be the, the leading vendor to, to offer the, the cyber security services to their consumers. So we've been gaining a lot of foothold, a lot of market share over time through those consolidations. So in the past, it was a big asset for F-Secure. Today, the, the number of partners is already so big, so I think it's more, more stable for us. And the, the net, network technologies, uh, hasn't impacted a lot at all to us. This and, and focus on endpoint security is quite techno, technology agnostic, actually. I think there are some interesting future aspects, as, as, as Chris, Chris was explaining, our thinking around F-Secure Sense. And we are also uh, busy with a lot of talks that could F-Secure Sense also be used as a software, so embedded to operator routers instead of F-Secure hardware, but, but then you can add an element of operators exploring like uh, software-defined networks. And then, then that could spin it even further. So could F-Secure sense as a software, what kind of role that could take at the software-defined networks? So that technology transit is perhaps a uh, business development opportunity for F-Secure. So that maybe offers some, some color to that. Uh, Rauha, the from Danske Bank again. Actually, a couple of questions on the consumer side. Uh, firstly, do you think that the, the Gardner estimates, the 1.3% CAGR, already reflects the growth in the VPN as well as the sort of um, home IoT opportunity? And then the second question is that, is there some technological advantage that you get from the consumer business other than just you know, providing cash flow for the, uh, the uh, B2B business to grow? Uh, I think that Gartner number that, that includes the, the VPNs and the potential IoT security, I think Gartner similarly as we, they are very uh, cautious, kind of are not to, not, not to boost the IoT security n numbers to, to create heights as there really is no, no, no nobody carries any, any real evidence yet, so we, we also are very cautious. Uh, with that, although excited about the about, about the opportunity, of course, uh, the advantage. So 
Yes, consumer business is very cash rich for us, but I think uh, there, are, there are elements like, uh, I think Chris gave some ideas about that, that uh, and, and perhaps Mikko as well. So if you look at f -Secure Sense, that was primarily developed for, for consumer, really protecting the whole digital home. You can quite easily see some business development uh, initiatives there that uh, could the f -Secure Sense like a product fit also to to small businesses, because more and more the small businesses, they are having all their IT infrastructure in the cloud. It's not like they have the IT systems, the servers and gateways and whatnot. It's, it's they, they carry endpoints, which we protect, but then they have the connected devices at the office. They might have the Wi-Fi coffee makers, Wi-Fi light bulbs, whatnot. So the use case is quite similar what you would have in your connected home. So we are definitely looking at that an opportunity as an overflow from consumer actually to, to be the B side. So I think that's an in interesting topic that we are exploring. Okay. Matteri Konen Carnegie, when we hear you talk about uh, the investments in products, uh, sales and marketing, etc., maybe acquisitions as well it's kind of easy to come to the conclusion that that uh, profit is not the kind of uh, primary driver of your business at least this year probably next year either but um, should we assume that your investments would accelerate accelerate compared to this year so that you would kind of uh, go below the current profit level which which you are targeting or what how should we look at next year financially i mean that it's not a big issue thinking about company value but uh, for some people the profits are also interesting so it might be um, <laughs> interesting to hear your your views how you think about it at, at the moment yeah i can offer some some elaboration to the topic so first you are, you are very right, so we are, we are not gearing for uh, optimizing short-term profits, but that's, that's there. The, the second is that uh, although this industry is now witnessing many companies with uh, almost ridiculous uh, investment levels, so many of our uh, lovely American uh, competitors are running on red numbers, so our current thinking is that we, we don't see us currently taking f secure to the red numbers we have not actually totally excluded that from our thinking but that would really need to be a, a result of us seeing an opportunity where you see a growth that is totally different versus the growth what we see now so we first would want to see some results materializing and then being encouraged with that before we increase investment level uh, now for what comes to next year so obviously there's no, there's no guidance for, for that uh, available at, at this stage. Something that we are looking at and uh, I guess the main thing is the thinking that we are really optimized for or go for growth. But we also want to be cautious that, because uh, it's so easy to spend money. I mean, I could go, go next year and t go talk to our marketing department and hey, surprise. You just got yourself 10 million more marketing budget, and then then you you know you probably would know what that would do to our profitability short term. So we try to take somewhat conservative view. So whatever we spend, we need to be sure that the money is used uh, efficiently. And I, I've said that to many investors that when we when we start to see evidence, some early indicators that the company would perform better if we would invest more, most probably we would. Today, I think if we would invest significantly more, as you said, like if next year would be, or break even, or, or whatever, really, really different posture. So I'm, I, I'm not comfortable today to say that the money would be well spent, but it would be spent, but we don't want to go there. So some, some elaboration, not any precise answers. Okay, so now we discussed the uh the short-term view for, uh, in terms of making money. What about then uh, in terms of generating revenue? Uh, what do you see, let's say, going to 2018? 
biggest opportunities in terms of generating revenue and then maybe some of the risks as well that you see? Well, Tapio, I think, I think whether it was your purpose or not, but uh, I think uh, generating revenue is, of course, what we, we want to be doing. But uh, I think what Eric also uh, gave some, some viewpoints about our business model, like if, if I take just a point example, like Q3, our, our B2B revenue grew 11%, and whereas the orders grew 20%. So for us, for internally, what we are really going for is this ordering intake growth. Of course, some of that will be recognized as revenue. So that, that's maybe just a other, other type of an answer. But uh, definitely opportunities we, we see on this XDR, as I introduced that uh, terminology. So we have high expectations for RDS going to win, win market share, uh, winning new customers, even competitor replacements as we we gave some uh, some color at the at the last interim report. Uh, I'm I'm excited about the EDR, so the the fully productized version, the, the pure pure technology version of the uh, of the detection. So that definitely should be yielding growth acceleration, but most probably towards the the second half of the year, not the not the first half of the year. And uh, I'm very confident on the stability of our consumer business. I think Chris, Chris who gave you guys good examples. What, what are the things we are working? There are many opportunities for a good confidence level there. And I think we, we, continue, we will continue seeing the cybersecurity consulting that there's going to be demand beyond what, what we can supply. So I'm expecting that to continue drive very high utilization rates. And uh, so XDR is perhaps what what, what, what my eyes are set on for, for growth acceleration. So then the risk bit. Well, risks, I think this, this industry carries a, a, a huge talent shortage. So although the consulting business or the cybersecurity services, it's not the main vehicle for F-Secure, it's complementary and adjacent to product business, but we want to grow that business as well. And, and for that, uh, bringing in the right people is, is, is important. So I think that is one of the risks so that are we able to, to hire? I think we saw already Q3, so, so we, we were quite vocal that Q, Q3 we actually had a better than planned profitability, but I was very honest also that it, it was perhaps for the wrong reasons that our hiring was delayed. So I think that this hiring and, and you being able to place the growth investments is, is a risk. risk. And then I think there, there is always that risk that uh, uh, are you focused enough so that you get to stay competitive at what we do? Because they, although the market is brilliant, it's a huge market, fast growth market, but staying competitive is, is very, very difficult. We are up against many companies who are just almost equally as brilliant as F-Secure. Almost. So. Um, just a question on the active M&A. Um, should we assume that the sort of size uh, of the M&A is similar to the ones that you've been doing in the past year, the little ones that you bought? Uh, and uh, w why has there been so few acquisitions from uh, F-Secure? I mean, you had a strong balance sheet for quite some time. So what has been the reason that you actually haven't deployed that money? Mm -hmm. Great question. I think first that uh, m maybe I, I wouldn't want to box us uh, on the M&A front to the same size of a companies that you saw as acquiring this year, uh, they, they were maybe on the smaller end of the spectrum. So perhaps that now ans answers that, that the spectrum that we are looking is much bigger than the size of the companies that we looked for. Uh, so I would, I would hope us to find a good targets that would be much more sizable than the ones we did this year. The second, comment or question from you was uh, that, that uh, we've been very picky. We, 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 we have looked at a lot of companies, but we will we, we also be very conscious that uh, is this something that we can onboard sufficiently? 
is this something that we can we can make the the acquisition target a better business in our hands? Can we develop that business? So it's not that we pay the premium and that's the end of it. So can we can we make it better versus what it looks now? We be very conscious already that that does it fit to our overall offering? Because in this industry it's so easy to make a sidestep acquisitions. You buy this company and you buy this company and the, the combination of these then don't add up. You end up building something that really doesn't uh, look like a, a solid story, solid one story, but you, you actually start to look like a holding company. You start to look like a collection of technologies, collection of companies, and I don't want to take f to that direction, actually to the, to the opposite, to more a firmer pack that this is exactly what this company does. So we just haven't found the, the right company with the right valuation. I, I have many, many names in my pockets that would be the, pretty much the right company, but it's also the valuation question that uh, if you guys are following uh, acquisitions in this space, so sometimes the valuations are pretty, pretty tough. You, you might pay kind of a uh, 10x EV to sales for companies that are loss making. And, and if we would be making a move like that, then you would really need to be 100% sure that this is a brilliant fit and it just elevates you as a company strategically to a different level. But acquisitions, it, that's, that's an art. And uh, we are, although we want to be doing acquisitions, absolutely, but we are not in a rush to make bad decisions. Matti. Matt Rigonen, Carnegie. Since you started to talk about the acquisitions, uh, do you have any any kind of concrete valuation metrics that you have decided uh, to to go uh, go with, so that you have, would have an absolute no go above a certain valuation range, no. or it, it it just depends. Such such a framework doesn't doesn't exist. We, we've looked at companies whose valuation could be kind of up uh, beyond what, what F-Secure today carries. So if I take like EV to sales in our own case, so we've, we've looked at comp comp companies that from that perspective would be more expensive. So, but we, we don't have uh, any, any fixed frame. I think it's the strategic fit that is, is the essence here. I think that's that's really, really important. Then another, uh, another question uh, regarding sense. What are the operators currently saying about sense? What are you talking about? Uh, what, what's the kind of feedback from operators and and uh, the kind of timeline we should expect that there would be some some new deals perhaps? Maybe. Chris, so you can tell what the operators are, are, are telling about sense, sense so far. It varies. Some operators are happy to sell sense as it is today as our own box. So you can go today in Finland to operator outlets and, and find sense from there. Uh, we are having some uh, deals in making in, in other parts of the world not just Europe, but many operators are, are basically having a one box strategy or at max two boxes. So they, they ship their own routers and then they have a set top box next to that. So I would say that in the operator business in the longer term, uh, the more uh, the more attractive business model is probably sent as a software than, than selling routers. But the box that we have today is a very important piece of the business development because it is a proof of concept also for the operators and it, it is showing what it could be. So it, it really varies. The bigger the operator, the more control they have on their box. That's, that's kind of a rule of thumb. You go to the biggest operators and they might have 100 people working just to create their own proprietary box which they then out or which they then procure from someone uh, who is who's just manufacturing that. And then you have operators that are selling just completely standard boxes and, and in between you have operators 
that are making some specifications and it's it's a custom built for them but from a leading brand consumer brand perhaps did this answer the question So, uh, yeah, continuing with sense. So, if I understood correctly, now the business case is that it's, it's a router product, uh, software embedded in hardware. But what does it take for you to sell it as a software? And then uh, on the competition, you're in the router business, so are you competing with router companies that are also investing in uh, cybersecurity features and what's kind of like your competitive differentiator on, on that space? Well, we are working with router manufacturers as well. Uh, our focus is though more on working with those router manufacturers that sell through the operators or build for the operators rather than taking leading kind of a consumer brand retail focused uh, routers because that's a very ruthless and, and kind of a price sensitive market. Um, so on, on then uh, putting sense capabilities to the, the operator box, one of the things that we have to look into is, is what is the footprint that the, the routers have, what is the memory and what is the processing power that they have. Uh, the, the capabilities that we have in, in Sense is something that is more, re I mean, that you can put it to kind of a new products, next generation products. But if you look at the install base where you might have products that have four to eight megabytes of memory available and, and all processors, I mean, root, uh, routers can be five to seven years old, then they are probably not fit to take a lot of new capabilities. So we have productized. Uh, different levels of, of capabilities, so kind of standard three levels, which is starting from an eight megabyte small thing, which is only a subset of the capabilities, going to the full stack of what we have in the box. So it varies, and, and in some cases we're talking about enhancing future products, and in some cases we are also talking about shipping out or delivering something for the existing installed base. Thank you. Uh, as we are now closing the end, I'm just thinking maybe one soft w softer question for someone. Yeah. You've been with the company for 12, 13 years now, is mm -hmm. it? And uh, as you mentioned, most of that time we had a strong consumer focus. And now for the past three years at least, it has been a strong B2B focus. Have you seen some change, if any, uh, in the company culture or, or where you're working here? Of course, quite a bit. So uh, I think uh, what has stayed the same, what is really the, the F-Secure deeply rooted core DNA is that we are a, a software and security company by heart. I think that, that has never changed. Actually, that this, uh, this current strategy where, where we are maybe emphasizing our B2B business more versus the, the consumer business, Actually, many of our best experts who work at F-Secure Labs, in the, in the, the, the people likes of Mikko Hyppönen, I, I think that many of them actually enjoy this, this strategy a lot more because they get to work with more complicated products and with more complicated issues. So I think culturally this hasn't been a, a difficult shift. Uh, I think in the past, I, I've been so long here that it, it's easy to reflect. I think we, have a, we had actually a culture-wise uh, a harder time when we were entering in this content cloud business. So we started that business as very adjacent thinking to secu security so that, that that was meant to be a backup business. And backup, is, it goes quite well with security. And I think that the marriage looked pretty, pretty cool at start. But when we started to see how, how that market develops, that, well, consumers, they, they are not really into backup. They just want to just put stuff to the cloud, but the use case was not backup. They wanted stuff to the cloud, and they w wanted to be able to see the content from various dev devices. They wanted to be able to share the content. They wanted to be able to modify the content. So it really becomes content-centric not security centric. And at that point of time, many people at F-Secure well, was thinking that, hey, what's, what's happening? Are we abandoning our roots? We are supposed to be 
a hardcore cybersecurity company, and this is something else. The use cases are not security. So I think that was a harder time culturally for F Secure. I'm really happy how the how the company is feeling feeling today, actually. Okay. Any final questions? Okay. Then that concludes our Q and A session. Thank and you. The Capital Markets Day. So thank you, thank you, Samu, thank you, other presenters, thank you for the audience, uh, and thank you for the people watching us online. Um, we look forward to speaking to you again in February, as mentioned, when we disclose our full year results. Have a nice day.